Next, a court hearing involving a death penalty case. Earlier this month, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces heard the appeal of the death sentence in U.S. v. Curtis. The hearing involves the death sentence of Lance Corporal Ronnie Curtis. He was found guilty of the murder of two people. The defense is hoping to overturn the death sentence. The hearing lasts two hours and 45 minutes. Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is now open and in session. God save the United States of America and this Honorable Court. The Court calls United States versus Curtis. May it please the court, Commander Hall and Lieutenant Schreier for the appellant, Lance Corporal Ronnie Curtis. With the court's permission, we'd like to reserve 15 minutes of our time for rebuttal. Great the death penalty, the most irreversible punishment known to man, is the ultimate sanction that a society can take against one of its citizens. As Justice Stewart wrote in Furman v. Georgia, the penalty of death differs from all other forms of criminal, criminal punishment, not in degree, but in kind. It is unique because it is totally irrevocable. It is unique because it rejects rehabilitation as a basic purpose of criminal justice. And it is unique, finally, because of its absolute renunciation of all that is embodied in our concept of humanity. For a just society to be assured that it was morally correct in inflicting such a punishment, it must do so only where that society's courts can state with certainty that the results of the condemned man's trial were reliable, both specifically and systemically. The need for reliability is more than just a notion or an ideal. It's an absolute, unwavering bedrock of American capital jurisprudence. And yet that template of reliability does not fit squarely on Lance Corporal Curtis's case. Indeed, it's the lack of reliability which is the common thread running among the issues we present in argument today. We ask this court, how could Lance Corporal Curtis's death sentence be considered reliable in light of his counsel's ineffectiveness? How could it be considered reliable in light of confusing sentencing instructions and the fact that the panel found excessive aggravating factors, indeed where now there are no longer any aggravating factors as to one of the two capital murder convictions? And finally, we ask how Lance Corporal Curtis's death sentence could be considered reliable in light of the offhanded manner in which the lower court conducted its proportionality review, ironically a procedure designed to safeguard against capriciousness. This case is not a moral debate about the role of the death penalty in American society in general. It's not an emotional focus on the death of Lieutenant and Mrs. Lutz, because indeed their deaths were a tragedy. Rather, this case is about an objective search for trustworthiness the trustworthiness of our system, and the trustworthiness of this case in particular. Although this is the third time that Lance Corporal Curtis has argued before this court, it's really his first opportunity he's had here to argue how the performance of his trial defense team affected the reliability of the adversarial process in his case. We have argued in our brief that ineffective assistance of counsel, or IAC, has permeated this entire trial, this entire court-martial at the trial level, from what the trial defense team did pre-trial, from what they did at the court-martial, and what they did post-trial. Today, however, we've singled out one of the primary deficiencies in the defense team's performance. This is a flaw which in itself demonstrates the danger of simply relying on affidavits to resolve IAC claims in a death penalty case. And it's the flaw which we feel best symbolizes how the trial defense team's faulty performance so affected the reliability of the panel's findings and especially its sentence. The flaw which I choose to address is the trial defense team's failure on the merits in sentencing, but especially on sentencing, to make reasonable use of a wealth of information as to Lance Corporal Curtis's intoxication at the time of the killings. Your Honor, sir. 
What issue are you focusing on? Which number? This is issue one, Your Honor. The overall question in the member's mind at the court martial is not whether Lance Corporal Curtis killed the Lutzes. It was why Lance Corporal Curtis killed the Lutzes. Counsel, let me interrupt for just a moment. <clears throat> The government's position, I understand, is that it was a tactical decision uh, not, not to get into that. Is that right? Yes, sir. And, and uh, that's the intoxication aspect? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, well, what's your uh, answer to that? Sir, we believe that it was not a reasonable decision that a defense counsel making a reasonable performance with the knowledge that this trial defense team had prior to trial should have done more with the evidence as to voluntary intoxication, not only on the merits but especially on sentencing. Wouldn't it have been inconsistent with the premeditation uh, uh, evidence, however? Well, Your Honor, we don't agree with the decision of the trial defense team to focus exclusively on a manslaughter defense. If I may invite the court's attention to the argument that was actually presented by the trial defense team on the merits, we see that they actually presented an inconsistent defense. On one hand, the major argued to the panel that Lance Corporal Curtis was guilty of voluntary manslaughter as to the killing of the lieutenant. He argued absolutely nothing about intoxication and how it may have affected that decision. Yet moments later, the major argued that with regard to the killing of Joan Lutz, Lance Corporal Curtis was guilty only of unpremeditated murder because, I quote, Lance Corporal Curtis was drunk out of his mind and in a rage. We would ask the court how that could be logically consistent inasmuch as the trial defense team did not argue intoxication for the first killing and yet argued intoxication as a factor as to the second killing, which occurred only moments later. How much did... Uh Curtis drink that night uh, the, of the, uh, the murders? From the record, Your Honor, he testified that he drank approximately a pint of gin, and that seems to be consistent with what the other statements were given to the Naval Investigative Service. I may add he also testified that gin was not his usual, implying that he was not usually a gin imbiber. Okay, and this came out. Uh, did it come out on direct or on cross? Actually, Your Honor, it came out on direct, and in fact, those were the only two questions that the trial defense team asked on direct examination of so the they client. didn't they didn't ignore intoxication, they just didn't emphasize it. Is that is that the distinction here? Well, Your Honor, they I mean, it came out that he, he drank a pint of gin before he went out and, and committed these acts. Yes, sir. But what the trial defense team didn't do was tie in for the members edification, if you will, how drinking that pint of gin affected Lance Corporal Curtis's thought process and action process at the time of the killings. There was a wealth of information that the trial defense team had access to, most notably the results of the 706 board, which said that it was doubtful that but for the intoxication, it was doubtful but for the fact that Lance Corporal Curtis was drinking on the night of the killings, that the killings would even have occurred. It was the same 706 or Sanity Board report, Your Honors, that said that at the time of the killing, Lance Corporal Curtis's BAC was around a .20. And even though there was some evidence that Lance Corporal Curtis may have been a, I hate to use the term habitual because I don't think it rose to that level, but somebody who drank every week, once a week, they said that certainly somebody with his history of drinking would feel an impact from a .20 which belies the argument that because he may have been a consistent drinker that a point two zero wouldn't phase him in the least. Counsel, back to Judge Wiss's question just a moment. And I'm sure you're going to get into this, but it looked to me from studying the record and studying your brief that the entire thrust of the defense of Lance Corporal Curtis was that here was a solid, decent, Christian, law-abiding young man who snapped because of perceived or actual racial slurs. And that was the thrust of the defense throughout, throughout the mitigation, throughout the extenuation, everything. Now, the defense that you were proposing should have been done, and which you supported with a lot of learned treatises and other things, was this was a guy who snapped maybe for those reasons, but also because he was under the influence of alcohol and because he had been abused as a child, because he had no foundation or roots from which to judge his conduct. and that, Those are completely opposite approaches. And what it seems the question Judge Wiss asked you was, isn't this a tactical decision that may have been reasonable for the defense to pursue? 
albeit it didn't work. Well, Your Honor, I mean, aren't we second guessing? Well, Your Honor, we would beg to differ that this is second guessing in light of the fact that we are required when ineffective assistance of counsel is raised to go back and examine the acts from the perspective of the trial defense team. In this case, that means going back to what the trial defense team actually did in 1987 to get ready for trial. One of the things that disturbs us here is the degree of preparation, or perhaps we feel the lack of degree of preparation, that the trial defense team actually employed in examining whether or not to rule out altogether this intoxication defense. If we compare the two affidavits, the first two affidavits submitted by the lead counsel, lead trial defense counsel in this case, we'll see that they're totally inconsistent with each other and with the record. This particular trial defense counsel is very, very confused to put it charitably, at the time that he prepared these affidavits. On one hand, in his first affidavit, he claims his theory was that he argued that intoxication was enough to reduce premeditated murder all the way down to manslaughter, which we know he did not argue. He also claims that he argued that Lance Corporal Curtis was drunk out of his mind and didn't know what he was doing. We know that's certainly not true with the argument that he presented with regard to the killing of Lieutenant Lutz. He merely argued with regard to the killing of the lieutenant that this heat of passion from the perceived racial slurs pushed him to the edge, but not a word about intoxication. In fact, Your Honor, if, if I may invite the Court's attention to the Major's opening statement where he even shifted the burden of proof onto the defense and invited the jury to make him prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Lieutenant Lutz was indeed, in his terms, a racist, prejudiced individual. We don't believe that that's a reasonable tactic. We don't believe that there was a reasonable investigation as to the intoxication or several of the other dozen factors we've listed in the brief. Certainly not a reasonable presentation at trial. Okay, w one other question and then I won't interrupt you. Uh, in a medical malpractice case, it's pretty traditional for the proof to come forward from other practitioners in the area. Uh, that, that, the, that the procedures employed by the physician or how he did the procedures, that type of thing, do not conform to the standards as recognized by the American College of Surgeons or whatever. Uh, do we have anything in this record from learned death penalty practitioners that would, that would testify under oath other, or an affidavit form from other attorneys that they have reviewed these tactics? that they have reviewed the record and that, that, that this would not conform to the standards expected of a death penalty litigator? Actually, we do, Your Honor. In fact, those are the affidavits that were admitted before the lower court from Mr. David Durbin and from Mr. Steve Carroll, both of whom are experienced civilian death penalty practitioners. And although the exact number of the exhibit escapes me at this point in time, I would invite the court to go back and read those very carefully because they both address not only the theory on the merits, but especially the failings of the trial defense team during the sentencing has, has portion. Has the government filed any counter affidavits from other practitioners that, are, that would rebut that? No, Your Honor, they have not. Thank you. The merits of this case aside, what we find absolutely stunning is the fact that the trial defense counsel didn't use any evidence of voluntary intoxication anywhere on the sentencing portion of this case. We know from Supreme Court case after Supreme Court case how important the penalty phase is in a capital murder case. Indeed, many commentators, many authors of treatises have said that it's the penalty phase that is the most important part of most capital murder cases. The fact that Lance Corporal Curtis was drinking before the killings is not mentioned even once during the sentencing portion of this Marine's capital murder trial. There were no documents presented, there were no witnesses presented, there was no argument made, there were no instructions given, there was nothing during the sentencing portion of this capital murder case to explain to the panel that this was anything other than what they may have perceived as a cold-blooded killing. Now, in our military justice system, voluntary intoxication has long been recognized as a general factor in mitigation. But I would also invite the court's attention to the fact that it's a specific mitigator in capital cases. Indeed, all 30 states which enumerate mitigating circumstances address impairment, as does the federal system. Federal law lists impairment as a mitigator in aircraft piracy and drug kingpin capital statutes. Oddly enough, in Appellate Exhibit 24, the trial defense team listed intoxication as a proposed mitigator for instructions to the panel, but they never followed up and requested that the military judge give that particular instruction. In other words, give the instruction to the members that intoxication was a mitigator in this case. 
Now, recently, this court examined the issue of intoxication in United States versus Loving. And we would like to highlight some of the distinctions between what the trial defense team did in the Loving case and what the trial defense team did in Lance Corporal Curtis's case. Unlike Loving, here, the trial defense counsel offered no explanation at all why he didn't address intoxication on sentencing. He was asked, but he never answered. I invite the court's attention to the first affidavit provided by the lead trial defense counsel, where he was asked why he didn't use alcohol as a mitigating circumstance. Either he wanted to duck the issue, or he didn't understand the significance of intoxication as a mitigator in a capital case. He didn't understand the term of art, mitigating circumstance, in other words, because at that point in that first affidavit, he simply addressed why he didn't use intoxication on the merits. He also claimed, incidentally, that the 706 board gave the impact of intoxication very little significance. And yet, as I've already pointed out to the court, the 706 board said it was doubtful, but for the intoxication, that these killings would have occurred. Now, getting back to what I promised about drawing some distinctions between the Loving case and the Appellant's case, we would invite the court's attention to the following factors. In United States versus Loving, there was apparently a two-day crime spree that would have diminished, if you will, the argument that Private Loving's intoxication started out innocently enough. Additionally, there was drug usage in Private Loving's case, and there's certainly no evidence here that there was any drug usage by Lance Corporal Curtis. This court found that in the Loving case, it appeared that there was weak evidence as to intoxication that may have seemed contrived. Now, at this point, I would like to invite the court's attention to the fact that there were three documents in the defense's possession, government documents provided by North Carolina State Police, which demonstrated how intoxicated Lance Corporal Curtis was the morning after the killings. We know that he failed the field sobriety test at 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning. He had glassy eyes. He had liquor on his breath. He was swaying. He was slurring his words. He blew a .06 on the breathalyzer. And we know that Trooper Addison rated him as severely impaired, the worst category North Carolina offers for its DWI rankings. Counsel, this was several hours after the murders, wasn't it? Yes, Your Honor, it was. But we would <coughs> offer to the court the fact that there was before evidence, if you will, and after evidence, if you will, as to this degree of intoxication. The point, excuse me, but 0.06 is not a very high level of intoxication. No, Your Honor, but it, there's no no state that I'm aware of that would uh, uh, consider that a presumptive level for DUI, for example. 0.10 is the most common. Yes, Your Honor, but the importance of that 0.06 is that that's what he blew seven to eight hours after the killings. I understand, and the in the uh, the loss perhaps is about 0.01 per hour. So. We could say that if he hadn't consumed any between the killings and the test, he might have been 0 0.14. But well, that's Your Honor, still not what you'd call a real high level of intoxication, is it? Well, Your Honor, we have to remember that the BAC separately was computed by the 706 board and found it as a 0 0.20. There are two ways of computing a BAC, not only starting at a later point and then working your way backwards, that's the Widmark extrapolation, but also by taking somebody's known weight, how much they've had to drink over how long a period of time. Now, I realize this all looks like voodoo math or whatever, trying to compute some of these numbers. But what is consistent is the fact that the various experts who have examined Lance Corporal Curtis and even the 706 board <coughs> have ranked this BAC at the time of the killings as anywhere from a 0.20 to as high as a 0.26. Well, that, that's the voodoo part of that is I, nobody knows how much alcohol they consume. The only real solid evidence that there is about the amount of alcohol he consumed is the 0 0.06. Well, Your Honor, we have his confession where he did say that he had a pint of gin, and that was not rebutted by anything else in the record. Indeed, the trial counsel even addressed that fact in his opening statement, that there was a pint of gin. So I think for purposes of argument, we can assume that there was a pint of gin consumed by Lance Corporal Curtis because there's nothing to refute that. Was he carrying some uh, alcohol with him between the uh, time of the murders and the time that he was uh, uh, tested? I believe so, Your Honor. What's significant is that he did state in his confessions he had nothing to drink after a certain point in the evenings before the killings. And if we're going to use Lance Corporal Curtis's confessions for the truth as to certain of the offenses before this court, certainly we should take his statement and that at face value as well. But the gin bottle was found in the car 
lieutenant's car that he had stolen. Your Honor, there was a canteen that had some gin still in it. Lance Corporal Moore came back to the barracks room and found the gin bottle I empty see. lying That's there correct. the night before. Uh, to, to, to get to the uh, practical effect of the intoxication defense in this case, uh, let's look at what happened and then compare it with what a emphasis on intoxication would have produced as a different result. <coughs> now, in this case, according to the confession, uh, that afternoon after he got off work, he listened to music for the next several hours and, and drank over that time period. It says during this time he consumed approximately one pint of gin. Then he went for a walk. Uh, and now that's probably early evening. And he began thinking of things. And then he decided to get Lieutenant Lutz for picking on him. So he went into a supply building and, and broke into the supply building, picked a lock on the security cage, got a marine large knife with a seven inch blade, and then he at that time broke a, you know, damaged an office computer. Then he went back to his barracks room and to get a set of, a pair of gloves so he wouldn't leave any fingerprints. And then he stole a bicycle and, and drove 1.5 miles to the Lutz home arriving a little bit after midnight where he devised a scheme to trick his way into the lieutenant's home and where he began the, the two murders. Now, if, if this intoxication defense was so important, uh, isn't it more important in a case where the guy just drinks and gets drunk out of his mind and then does an impulsive thing and then there's where the excuse, but it seemed like there was a drinking period after work, and then all the way till midnight was this sort of plan and, and transportation to the crime scene, getting into the crime scene, and then committing th these crimes. I just don't think that the um, intoxication defense, uh, you know, re really would have been relevant, uh, you know, as, as a determinative factor in that kind of scenario. Well, sir, I must respectfully disagree with the Chief Judge in light of the affidavit provided by Dr. Phillips. Okay. And Dr. Phillips said that an individual who's undergoing... This was provided post-trial. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, actually, during the appeal process. Yes, Your Honor, that's right. correct. But we would invite the Court's attention to Dr. Phillips's affidavit where he says that to the average layman such as myself, looking at the acts that Lance Corporal Curtis did, it may seem implausible to try and tie in intoxication. And yet, in light of the depersonalization episode and the fugue-like behavior that Lance Corporal Curtis had exhibited during the night, in the terms of an expert, that information should have been provided to the panel. And again, Chief Judge, even if this information was not provided on the merits, even if the court does not agree with appellant that this should have been provided on the merits, we have no explanation from the trial defense counsel whatsoever why this was not provided during the sentencing portion of the trial. Counsel, what was the, uh, what was the, the finding of the 706 board? Did you, did you say that they found that the, that the alcohol probably was the, the, the motivating factor in the... Uh, in yes, the Your thing? Honor, if you will, it was the catalyst for the evening's events. And again, it was doubtful, but for an intoxication that the killings would have occurred. We would invite what the What did they base that on? Pardon me, sir? What did they base that on? That he didn't have the intent, that he, he didn't have the, the will, that he didn't have the desire to uh, c commit the offenses? No, Your Honor, the 706 board did not find premeditation to be inconsistent with the intoxication that night. Uh, we take several factual exceptions with some of the events that the 706 board described, but I won't address that at this point in time since that would be a digression from Your Honor's question. The 706 board did say, however, that the intoxication was certainly a mitigating factor in this case. Now, if I may use a very simplistic analogy, as I'm known for doing, in a way the racial slurs were the kindling in this case, and the intoxication was the spark to that kindling. Again, I realize that I'm probably oversimplifying the role of intoxication in this case to use such a simplistic analogy in such a serious decision as this. But again, that's how we view the voluntary intoxication. This very court found in United States versus Morgan that often it's the very ingestion of alcohol or other intoxicating substances that induces malicious and wrongful conduct. So even though occasionally voluntary impairment is seen as double-edged sword information, in this case it was not. This evening started innocently enough with two Marines 
albeit illegally, sitting around the barracks room drinking gin mixed with Mountain Dew. Then Lance Corporal Curtis started drinking the gin straight. The roommate left the room around 22.30, I believe, came back, found the room empty, found the gin bottle empty. Again, even if this information was not of use on the merits, it certainly should have been presented on the sentencing portion of this trial to demonstrate to the panel that this was not cold-blooded. Now, we know from Lockett versus Ohio and other Supreme Court cases that what's relevant in a capital sentencing case is that the panel have access to all possible relevant information about the individual whose fate they hold in their hands. And they didn't have this information here. In fact, we believe that because voluntary intoxication was not mentioned anywhere in the witnesses, the documents, the argument, or the instructions, that the panel may have come to the very wrong conclusion that they could not consider intoxication as a mitigating factor in this well, case. Well, wait a minute. It, it was mentioned by your client, you know, that he drank a, a pint of gin. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like they left it out. Oh, you mean he was drinking? Oh, we wouldn't have given the death penalty if we'd known he was drinking, because, you know, that excuses it. It's not that. Uh, the, the fact finder is, is entitled to all the facts of the case. And, and the fact you did not, at trial, bring in a psychiatrist or a sociologist who would have said, oh, if someone's drinking, that excuses two murders. Uh, I don't think that's the same thing as, as not bringing it out. The fact of intoxication was in the trial, was it not? It was on the merits only, but Your Honor. It wasn't emphasized, perhaps, and perhaps they didn't have a psychiatrist say, you know, uh, th this person should be excused because they were drinking. Maybe you didn't have that, but, but would that have made a difference? Absolutely, Your Honor. It would have made a difference for several reasons. First of all, again, this was not double-edged sword information. There was no drug usage here. It wasn't like he sat around drinking in order to get some Dutch courage up to go out and commit these offenses. The first thoughts of premeditation on the record did not occur until very, very late in the evening. And yes, there were a series of events from which the layman looking at those events could conclude that there was premeditation. And we believe that is what the jury found. However, we believe the jury based that on improper presentation of evidence. But returning again to sentencing, the idea that the sentencing panel did not even have the opportunity to figure this voluntary intoxication into the mix of factors as to what they would do with the fate of this man was what we believe inexcusable in light of Supreme Court jurisprudence, which mandates that this information be made available. We would invite the how court would it, How would it have been made available if we could go back and try it today? And you were the defense counsel. How would you have presented this at the sentencing? For starters, Your Honor, I would have called in Lance Corporal Moore, who would have testified as to why he thought Lance Corporal Curtis was heavily drunk. In fact, Lance Corporal Moore told NCIS, at that point NIS, that Lance Corporal Curtis was too drunk to move. Now, we don't know at what point in the evening... Too, too drunk to move? Yes, Your Honor. And yet he went 1.5 miles after getting a bicycle, gloves, and uh, picking a lock to get a K-bar knife? Yes, sir. We don't know at what point in the evening Lance Corporal Curtis was at that point or if perhaps Lance Corporal Moore had some slight sense of exaggeration into his statement. But certainly Lance Corporal Moore needed to describe his observations of the appellant several hours before the killing. Lance Corporal Jones, another Marine at the barracks at that point in time, observed Lance Corporal Curtis. The next day he remarked to another Marine that Lance Corporal Curtis, excuse my French, was too fucked up, or Curtis was, excuse my French again, fucked up the night before. So I would start with the presentation of the two Marines at the barracks. I would start with Lance Corporal Curtis as well. But I would do more this time, Your Honor, than simply ask him two questions. Were you drinking and how much? It's as if you were putting a part of a TV set in front of the court and having the court figure out without directions what they're supposed to do with the parts of that TV set as far as the assembly is concerned. I would also bring in the evidence from the North Carolina State Trooper. I would bring in the evidence that showed the following morning how intoxicated Lance Corporal Curtis was. And I would tie this entire picture together for the members through the use of experts, because that's why courts recognize the usefulness of experts, so that they can educate the lay jury from making lay jury mistakes and explaining how certain things happen. So, Your Honor, if I seem a, a tad belligerent about what I would do in this case, it's because I've had three years to figure out what I would do if I had the chance to go back and represent Lance <coughs> Corporal Curtis at the trial level. And, and there's one other thing you would do. You would ask the judge for an instruction. Absolutely, Your Honor. 
And in fact, he did at one point suggest that as an alternative relief in one of the pretrial motions, Appellate Exhibit 24, but never went back and reemphasized that point with the court. Indeed, one of the issues we have not specifically requested oral argument on today has to do with the danger of holding instructions discussions and 802 conferences, and we well, believe that occurred here. How, how would the uh, intoxication evidence then tie in with your second contention as to the ineffective preparation of the sentencing portion? Well, Your Honor, again, I mean, we feel that the real danger here was that the panel may have come to the conclusion. No, no, I understand, I understand that as to the intoxication, but then you had, in my recollection from your brief, you had five or six other things in the sentencing phase that was not done properly either. The evidence from the parents and from yes, Your Honor, that's correct. And how does all this tie together? To we believe. See, you, you recall Judge Wiss's first question and my first question. It's not. It's not a question of whether this is the right way for you to have defended it. The question was: Was Boyette's way the wrong way? Because you got a choice to make in there, and he made one choice. It wasn't this way. It wasn't the bad guy picture. It wasn't the drunk, abused. Forgivable Marine. It was a guy who snapped because he was being uh, discriminated against. Your Honor, we can't help but believe that if the entire picture of Lance Corporal Curtis was presented to the panel, the three parts of this puzzle, the perceived racial slurs, the voluntary intoxication, and the history of the family dysfunction, now, I realize the abuse excuse, as I heard it just on court TV last night, is meeting with some dissatisfaction among certain corners of the uh, judicial world. But the fact remains, in 1987, this panel should have had the opportunity to hear all this information, and they did not. So, in regards to how this could have affected the sentencing panel, we firmly believe, without any doubt whatsoever, that the jury had the right to hear this information. Now, if the military judge, interestingly enough, under Lockett and Progeny, had been the one to exclude this information from the court, this would almost be open and shut. Because we know that the military judge cannot stand between the defense and presenting this information to a panel. And yet, tragically, it was Lance Corporal Curtis's own trial defense team that prevented the jury from getting to hear this information. And again, Your Honors, regardless of what the court ultimately concludes as to what use voluntary intoxication should have been made on the merits in this case, there has been no explanation provided whatsoever by the lead counsel as to why intoxication was not used on sentencing. That's a marked difference from the reasonable explanation given by the trial defense team in Private Loving's case. Counsel, the socio uh, uh, psychological investigation that you talk about in the evidence and the lack of, of presentation in the context they take it similarly as the intoxication. Uh, are you saying that the evidence wasn't used or that they didn't have the evidence to be used incident to uh, findings and, and sentencing? Your Honor, what we claim, what we contend is the fact that they did not conduct a reasonable investigation, analyze the results of that investigation, and then decide a tact of action. What this court said in United States versus Loving is that there must be reasonable investigation and also a competent presentation. We don't believe that this trial defense team did either. It had some evidence, however, I take it. But what you're saying is that it wasn't sufficient. Uh, again, Your Honor, you're correct in that this wasn't a just one theory type approach. What should have been done here was to portray Lance Corporal Curtis as a human being, which all the commentators, all the experts that I've provided to this court in our extensive brief say must be the first thing done in a capital sentencing panel or to a capital sentencing panel. Portray your client as a human being so that the panel understands they may not like them, but they'll at least understand who it is whose fate they hold in their hands. And that's what we feel should have been done in this case. Well, com the counsel did interview the appellant's family. And no evidence of abuse of any kind came out during those interviews. Yes, Your Honor, and I, that's true. Ironically enough, though, the lower court recognized that sometimes family members find this information to be embarrassing. They find it humiliating. If you will, they don't want their dirty laundry aired in public. And it takes an expert, not necessarily an expert psychosocial investigator, but somebody who knows what they're looking for to be able to elicit that information from a reluctant family member. If you'll recall, Your Honor, the second 
or rather the second seater of the trial defense team, simply went to Lance Corporal Curtis's mother, a woman with 11th grade education, and said, get us letters from everybody in the world. Judge Cox, may I invite your attention to one of the affidavits from one of our experts to the extent that he opined that this collection of information on sentencing may have been great for an unauthorized absence case, but it was woefully inadequate for a capital sentencing panel. Your Honors, if there's no further questions on the ineffective assistance of counsel issue, I'd like to move on to the proportionality review issue. The uh, bringing out of the uh, racial slurs, you think that was, uh, I mean, that was brought out, but you think it should have been emphasized more, and how would you have done that? Your Honor, ironically, and uh, yes, Your Honor, I would have emphasized it, but in a slightly different way. The, major, uh, the, excuse me, the lead defense counsel stated that he didn't want to get into a battle of the experts with regard to the intoxication issue. We would invite the court's attention to the fact that he did get into a battle of witnesses with regard to the presentation of the evidence with regards to whether or not Lieutenant Lutz was indeed a racist. We agree with the lower court. We'll never know to this day whether or not Lieutenant James Lutz was in fact a racist. But we take strong exception to the trial defense team telling the jury up front, make us prove that he was, when they should have known that the evidence did not prove that. For example, Don Mickens, the black teenager who had lived at the Lutz house for several months while he helped Mrs. Lutz coach the basketball team, the trial defense team said there was no reasonable way we could have discovered the existence of this individual. And yet we know that's not true because Lance Corporal Moore, in his statement given to NIS just the day after the killings, came out and said, Lieutenant Lutz told me he couldn't have been prejudiced because he had a black teenager who'd been living at his house. So this big, mysterious, behind door number one rebuttal witness that the trial defense team said in its affidavits was so damaging to its case was under their nose the whole time. So we do not again believe that there was either a reasonable investigation or a competent presentation of evidence, especially on the sentencing portion of this capital murder offense. You keep emphasizing the sentencing portion. Uh, uh, what is your strongest argument that uh, the person wasn't sentenced properly? Your Honor, the strongest argument would be that they simply did not hear, the panel did not hear all the information. And in the absence of hearing all that information, how can we be confident that the result of that verdict, the result of that finding for the death penalty was reliable? We know that they gave the death sentence without that information, but we also contend that they would not have given the death sentence had they been presented that information. And certainly Lance Corporal Curtis deserves the chance to present that information to a sentencing panel. And the idea that his own trial defense team prevented him from doing so is an appalling one. If there's no further questions, may I turn to proportionality review? We'd like to address in this issue how NMCMR actually conducted its proportionality review in Lance Corporal Curtis's case. We believe that the process used by the lower court was unreliable because it used a flawed universe of cases. Proportionality review, as we know, is a way of fulfilling Greg versus George's mandate for a meaningful appellate review in capital cases. <coughs> the first step in conducting a proportionality review is defining the universe. And obviously, the first step in defining the universe is configuring which cases or which type of cases go into the pool of cases against which you're going to compare the appellants. Now, in Curtis II, this court wrote that it would be fitting for lower courts to consider generally similar cases reviewed by the Supreme Court in which state courts have imposed the death penalty, and I quote, for like crimes on that basis. And as this court pointed out, that means double murder during a burglary. Now, when this case went back on remand, as is ev evident from the record, it was heavily litigated as to what should constitute the universe. What I would simply like to do today is discuss why NMCMR's definition of the universe was flawed. NMCMR included three types of cases in its universe. One, post Furman Supreme Court cases in which state courts have imposed death. I'd invite the court's attention to the fact that there's no mention in that of double murder during a burglary cases or similar or like crimes. The second category is all military cases tried under the new manual in which the death sentence was actually imposed and the first stage of appellate review was complete. That means there's a whopping total of three cases, Loving, Gray, and Murphy, to compare against Lance Corporal Curtis's. 
None of those three that I just mentioned, Loving, Gray, or Murphy, involve a double murder during a burglary. Well, Loving was a double murder during a robbery. Yes, Your Honor, but we That's believe... That's fairly similar, isn't it? Reasonably similar. Well, specifically in Loving, this court emphasized the murder for pecuniary gain and found that that was the common thread, if you will, and that does not exist in appellant's case. Finally, the last modifier, if you will, used by the lower court for proportionality universe was all capital cases in the Naval Service, meaning Navy and Marine Corps cases, tried under the new manual, first stage of appellate review was complete, and where the accused was death eligible at the time of sentencing. Now certainly we are delighted at the prospect that the lower court has included some cases where the individual did not get the death sentence, because we believe the universe should include cases other than just those where everybody's sitting on death row together and comparing notes about their cases. Again, returning to our first problem, the post Furman Supreme Court cases. Whereas this court in United States versus Loving approved of the Army Court's proportionality review because it listed five specific cases that it compared private Lovings against to, we can look for days and we will find no mention in Lance Corporal Curtis's case of the lower court comparing Lance Corporal Curtis's case to even one Supreme Court case involving a double murder during a burglary. With regard to the 10 NMCMR cases that fit the third category, if you will, we have significant problems with that. If the court will recall that there are, these cases were listed in a footnote. Now the first problem we have with limiting the universe of cases for proportionality review is the idea that we're only going to look at cases in the Naval Service. The very reason why we have this court is because we have a uniform code of military justice. And the very notion that an appellate court would find it too difficult to get records of trial from their cross-town counterparts in the Army and Air Force and consider only certain Navy cases because of convenience is a repugnant idea to the idea of a thorough proportionality review. And yet that's indeed what the lower court did. We'd especially emphasize the fact that once all the branches of service get together and compile an initial master database, this problem won't even exist except for the addition of new cases. That's what happens in state jurisdictions. If a capital sentence is handed down, then the trial judge sends a little information data sheet off to some headquarters in the state capitol, and that person at the state capitol who reads that report enters into it some type of computer or data bank or whatever. But in this case, for the Navy court to say, it's convenient to look at Navy cases, but it's too much work to look at those cases across the Potomac is inappropriate. Again, of those 10 cases listed in that footnote, the bulk of them did not involve the same type of crime, a double murder during a burglary. Factually, one case was included in that pool of 10 that should not have been there, United States versus Relaford, because Relaford was not even eligible for death at the time of his sentencing. Although there were seven aggravating factors charged in that case by the government prior to the start of Relaford's court-martial, the findings were not unanimous, so Relaford should not have even been in that pool of 10 cases to begin with. And finally, the problem with this pool is that a case was left out. Schroeder was left out. Schroeder should have been included. So our emphasis today with proportionality review is that the universe of cases defined by NMCMR was faulty for the reasons that I've already defined or elaborated upon. Were you allowed to present cases that you felt were uh, uh, reflected the proper universe, counsel? Your Honor, we did present cases. Uh, if you will, we almost compiled the database for the lower court. Uh, in our brief, uh, our reply brief, as a matter of fact, that was submitted before the lower court. This was a very difficult process for the appellant because obviously we don't have the same access to the records that the court system itself has. In fact, we had to file a FOIA request to get some of the records in a, one or two cases that NMCMR ultimately included in their pool of cases we weren't aware about. In fact, the court was only aware about one of them. I believe it was United States versus Perez because the chief judge of NMCMR happened to work on that case when the chief judge had been stationed at appellate defense. So we think that's a rough way to run a railroad where the counsel themselves have to compile the database for the court and then the court comes up with some cases that counsel were not able to identify on their own. But the bottom line is you, were, you weren't uh, foreclosed in any way from presenting cases that fell within the universe as you defined it. No, Your Honor, we were not absolutely precluded from that. And were all of your cases double murders in a, um, in a robbery? No, Your Honor, they were not. Uh, if the court will recall, we had asked for a clarification order from this court as to exactly how the universe should be <coughs> defined. 
uh, uh, this court, uh, the majority dissented from providing any further elaboration on that. In our reply brief, we invited the court's attention to, I think, the case of Blodgett versus Harris out of the Western District of Washington, which discusses the due process ramifications of Perhaps forcing is not a good word, but it's the only one that immediately comes to mind. Counsel to argue a position in a proportionality review without being certain up front, if you will, as to what the definition of the universe is going to be. Isn't, isn't this idea of a proportionality review being a comparative review where you sit there and say, we found 10 cases that are similar and compare this one to those, isn't that, isn't that idea contrary to, this, to Furman versus Georgia and the idea that we should have individualized sentence and otherwise we would have proportionality built into the statute where it would say if you take two lives during a burglary you will suffer death. That is ultimately proportional and that's been rejected. We want to individualize. That's your whole first argument. And uh, so isn't proportionality review when you look at the universe you don't just sit there and start lining cases up? Isn't it proportional to what society accepts? as being the type of case where capital punishment is imposed. Isn't that what we mean by proportional? It's in proportion. The death penalty is in proportion to that crime, to that offense. Well, indeed, Your Honor, and our position is that not Otherwise, only the universe here would be only those cases where a young black soldier took the life of a white superior officer. Well, that would certainly leave Lance Corporal Curtis facially in the minority, if you will, Your then Honor. We would probably have to go back to the Vietnam era and look at some of the fragging cases and things of that nature well, to see Honor, if any actually, death penalties were handed down. Actually, in the 10 cases that NMCMR included, there were two cases involving enlisted members who killed officers on board ship, including one with a fact pattern which is eerie, eerie, eerily like Lance Corporal Curtis's, where uh, the Galloway case, I'll invite the courts to, to Galloway or Gar Garraway, where uh, he was an enlisted sailor who killed his officer on board ship. Neither of those two cases, either the Cologne case or the Garraway case, did the appellant in that case get the death sentence despite the fact he killed an officer. Secondly, the two cases that were listed that did involve double murder during a burglary, neither of them got the death sentence. So we have four cases which technically you could compare the appellants to if one looks at the double murder during a burglary or the fact that he killed an officer but we have no reason or no way of knowing how they actually compared those cases. I'd like to turn now, if I may, to the issues that we've raised with regard to the doesn't, sentencing. Doesn't your case go beyond the pale of, uh, of, of, a, of, of a enlisted man killing an officer? I mean, here we have a, we have a, a man killing his boss, uh, who happens to be an officer, in his home. And at the same time he's doing that, he, his wife comes in and he kills the wife, who, who has, you know, obviously, according to the record, not been part of this racial slur thing. He goes beyond that, kills the wife, and then he goes beyond that to, into depravity, if two murders is not depraved, I, uh, into fondling her while she's dying. And then, while they're dead, he steals not one, but two of their cars and money from the home. I mean, isn't, isn't yours, your, your case, I mean, the, the facts of this are, are, are beyond this, some of these comparative cases, aren't they? No, Your Honor, we don't believe that they are. If we could invite the court to go back and read the universe of cases that we presented, cases involving, if I may recall, a few of the fact patterns. One soldier who kills a female soldier or rather assaults her, leaves her out in the desert to be eaten by animals, kicks her in the head with his cowboy boots. Other cases involving women who are so sexually mutilated that they have objects put in orifices that don't belong there under any of the worst circumstances imaginable known to man. We have cases where, because the individual had the good luck to be tried in Germany rather than in the United States, there's political decisions that keep him from being death eligible. So we have offered dozens and dozens of cases to the best extent that we could get this information showing various factors. For example, the motivation in Lance Corporal Curtis's case. 
as was pointed out, the motivation of Private Loving's case was murder for pecuniary gain. There is no way that Lance Corporal Curtis's case, if one marries up every mitigating fact and every aggravating fact in this case, will ever have a mirror companion. So we must do our best with the points of comparison that we can identify. All we are asking is for the opportunity that if this case uh, if the court agrees with our argument as to proportionality review, that we be allowed to present additional factors now that we know the definition of the universe and this court resolves the definition of the universe by remanding this case to NMCMR. If I may turn now to the sentencing issues, I see my time is getting shorter, so if I talk faster, I apologize, but I want to save some time for my co-counsel. This court in United States versus Loving made use of a term which so aptly describes the process by which death is given at a court-martial. And that was the use of the term gate. So if I may, I'd like to take just a moment and lay out for the court the four gates that exist under RCM 1004. Gate 1, of course, occurs on the merits, and that is whether or not the findings on the merits are unanimous as to a capital offense. We won't be discussing that one, but that's gate 1. Gate two requires proof of an aggravating factor. For purposes of this argument, I won't be discussing that one. Gate three is what I will be discussing, and that's the balancing test. Under our system, the aggravators have to substantially outweigh the mitigators before death may be considered. And then finally, gate four is the awesome decision of life imprisonment or death. The first three date gates that I just described to the court determine death eligibility. If, for example, the government doesn't have unanimous findings as to a capital offense, then the panel can't consider death. Under gate two, if the government can't prove an aggravating factor, the same aggravating factor to the panel unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt, then the panel can't consider death. Gate three. Gate three is also a separate gate which must be reached before death can be considered. Under gate three, if even a single member, even a single member finds that the aggravating circumstances or aggravating factors do not substantially outweigh the mitigators, then the members are required to adjudge life because gate three is a separate gate. Now with regards to gate three, there are four possible outcomes to a discussion that the members may have as to gate three. One, the members or each individual member may conclude that the mitigators outweigh the aggravators. The second, that the mitigators rest in equal poise with the aggravators. The scales are even. The third is that the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, but not substantially. And then finally, that the aggravators substantially outweigh the mitigators. Under three of those four possibilities, death is not an option. Well, as the Chief Judge has pointed out with regard to the circumstances surrounding the death of Mrs. Lutz, wouldn't it be quite easy for the panel to find that that aggravation uh, substantially outweighed any mitigation that was presented in this case? Your Honor, we can only ask that question in a vacuum at this point because the panel did not hear the full panoply of mitigating information that the appellant was entitled to present on his side of that equation. Well, I understand. You're back to your first issue on that issue, right? Back to ineffective assistance of counsel. Yes, Your they Honor. They didn't present what they should have presented. But as far as the four gates were concerned, uh, it looked to, looks to me like on this record that we have before us that those gates could be passed through quite easily. Well, again, we don't question gate one and gate two for purposes of this argument. It's gate three that we have a problem with. And the specific problem we have, Your Honor, is the fact that the military judge never explicitly advised the members that they had to come to this by a unanimous concurrence. The other problem we have is that the military judge never advised the members that even if gates one, two, and three are cleared, that they still have the absolute discretion to decline to award the death sentence in this case. That was never explicitly explained in the instructions to the panel members. Was that explained in loving? Refresh my memory. That was such a lengthy opinion. I remember being concerned about that also in loving. Well, there's three big <clears throat> distinctions, as Your Honor uh, might there, understand, between was, was loving and Was an instruction and requested? 
In this case, no, it was not, Your Honor, but it was given in United States versus Loving. Yeah, because I recall in South Carolina, I was required as a trial judge to instruct the jury, even if they were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating circumstances. That we, did not require them to impose a death penalty, that that was a separate and distinct decision. Well, Your Honor, I may have misspoke. Of the ten and a half pages which address the sentencing instructions in this case, there is one sentence, all of one sentence devoted to this balancing test. Now, we're not advocating that the balancing test needs to be mentioned as many times as the aggravating test, but we do think that the military judge did not properly emphasize this gate three balancing test. Now, one of the difficulties that we have here is that in Loving, there was a sentencing worksheet which explicitly laid out on the top of page two this balancing test. If one examines the sentencing worksheet in Lance Corporal Curtis's case, they'll see two pages. The first page mentions only the aggravating factors. The second page mentions only the punishments. There is absolutely no mention whatsoever on Private Curtis's, excuse me, Lance Corporal Curtis's sentencing worksheet as to this balancing test, either that they have to come to a unanimous concurrence or that this balancing test is a requirement. Nor was it presented in the argument of counsel. Now, as a general rule, we want counsel to stand up and advocate the law to the panel, especially in a capital murder case. But if one goes back and reads the scandalously short sentencing argument of the trial defense team in this case, an argument which takes up all of about 14 paragraphs, two pages in the record of trial, never at one point in that sentencing argument did the trial defense team tell the jury, hey, here's the weaknesses in the government's aggravators, or here's the strength of our mitigators, and here's how you should do this balancing. He left it solely to the military judges and instructions. And the absence, again, in the absence of a worksheet which bolsters the instruction, or an argument which bolsters the instruction, all we can look at is the instruction itself. And in this instruction, one sentence. Now, one of the problems with how this particular sentence is worded is that it may have led the members to believe, and again, the standard is, is if even one reasonable juror may have been misled, then we have a problem with these instructions. But the way that this particular sentence was phrased, a reasonable juror could have understood the military judge to mean that if you clear gate three, there is no other reason not to award the death sentence in this case. There was not one place in the sentencing instructions where the military judge advised the members, if you clear gate one, you clear gate two, you clear gate three, you still have the absolute discretion to decline to award death. The members were not told that. But there was no request for such an instruction. Is that right, Counsel? That's correct, Your Honor. That was not. And we have raised that again as a difficulty in this case because of so much of these discussions taking place at 802 conferences on Sunday afternoons. The instructions in a capital case in an 802 conference, it just boggles the mind as to the reliability factor in that alone, Your Honor. Do you have any precedent for, uh, for such an instruction being given? In any other cases? I'm sorry, the, what type of instruction? Do you have any precedent for that, that type of an instruction being given? Well, Your Honor, we know from United States versus Loving that the jury does retain absolute discretion in that regard. And we would again invite the court's attention to the sentencing worksheet, which does def direct the members, if you will, how to go through this separate process. Now, there was one line given in Lance Corporal Curtis's instructions that says, you're at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence. But we would urge the court not to give that any weight whatsoever as to the reliability of the death instruction. And we would urge that for this reason. Lance Corporal Curtis, unlike Private Loving and the typical, if there can be a typical other death sentence case, received only a sentence of death. He did not receive the maximum punishment from the court. He did not receive death plus a dishonorable discharge, reduction to E1, and forfeiture of all pain allowances. And the fact that he did not receive the maximum sentence shows that the jury may have exercised their option to award a lesser sentence. In other words, death by itself is less than death plus all these other factors, which again are meaningless in light of the death sentence. But that does not cure the problem with the fact that the military judge never explicitly told them that they may decline using their discretion to award the death sentence, even if these other three gates are cleared. A member... He did tell them, in fact, he told them three times that they could only impose a death penalty if they found so by, by unanimous verdict. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. But 
that goes more to the number of votes. It does not go to the discretion that each juror has. It does not emphasize the discretion that each juror has to decline to award death. Well, isn't it reasonable to assume, if you're, if you're a member being instructed, that it has to be unanimous? If one doesn't vote for it, it's not going to be the death penalty. Yes, Your Honor, perhaps I'm not communicating this adequately enough. We don't, our position is that the military judge did not identify to them, not that the one vote problem existed, but the fact that they still had the discretion. And by discretion, I mean, what if one member did not want to award the death sentence because of the racial overtones in this case? Now, this member may in good conscience have found that gates one, two, and three are cleared. I understand your argument. So that is our problem, Your Honor, is the fact that this discretion, the nature of this discretion, perhaps that's how I should phrase it, was not adequately identified. Now, in other words, there's no instruction from the judge in this case that even, that I charge you, even if you find unanimously that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, you still must vote independently and separately as to whether you individually would impose a death penalty in this case. There was no such instruction, Your Honor. And that if one of you decides not to impose the death penalty, it cannot be imposed. There was no such instruction, Your Honor. So it kind of kind of leaves them in the air that if they find unanimously that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances, death automatically follows. That's our position, Your Honor. And again, we don't think that the sentencing worksheet did anything in this case, as it did in United States versus Loving, to help identify the panel's responsibilities for them. Well, there should be a number of cases in the state on that type of instruction. Well, of course, we're the only jurisdiction, Your Honor, that I've been able to identify that has the substantially outweigh standard. But, uh, for example, if we review the sentencing, the sentencing worksheet used in Mills versus Maryland, not the constitutionally infirm portion, which required the members to find mitigators beyond a reasonable doubt and unanimously, but just the sentencing worksheet there lays out for the members the process this has to go through. And in this case, the sentencing worksheet jumps from gate two to gate four. You would think gate three never existed except for that one sentence in the ten and a half pages of instructions. I haven't been aware until your argument. I don't know where I missed it, I guess, in the volumes of material, but <laughs> that, that the only sentence in this case was to death. That's correct, Your Honor. And again, that was less than the maximum that the court could have awarded. I think one could probably infer from that that the, that the members were caught in the emotion of it, wouldn't you? We'd certainly advocate that, yes, Your Honor. on the worksheet? Only death was circled on the worksheet, Your Honor, and that I mean, was all that was announced. these other factors weren't listed on the worksheet? They were on the worksheet, Your Honor. They were crossed out, and as no I recall. No questions were asked as to what they need to be done? No, Your Honor. If I may, in my last few minutes, I'd like to address how sentence appropriateness was conducted by the lower court. In a weighing jurisdiction, we know that aggravating factors serve two purposes. One, they narrow the class of death-eligible people. Gate two, in other words, the government has to prove an aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt or else the case is no longer death eligible. But the other purpose or role served by the aggravating factor is to guide the sentencing body in the exercise of its discretion. Now we know that in this case there were three aggravating factors presented to the members and that the members came back and found all three of these aggravating factors on the sentencing worksheet. Aggravating factor number one said that with regard to the death of Joan Lutz, the appellant had been found guilty, excuse me, the, uh, the murder of Joan Lutz was committed while the appellant was engaged in a burglary. Aggravating factor two, that with regard to the premeditated murder of Joan Lutz, the appellant was found guilty in the same case of another murder, that of Lieutenant Lutz. And the third aggravating factor is that with regard to the premeditated murder of Lieutenant Lutz, the appellant had been found guilty in the same case of another murder, that of Joan Lutz. So aggravating factors one and two aggravate only the killing of Joan Lutz. It was only aggravating factor number three which aggravated the murder of Lieutenant Lutz. We know from the procedural history of this case on remand that the lower court set aside the third aggravator. So whereas before there were two factors aggravating the death of Joan Lutz and one aggravating factor aggravating the death of Lieutenant Lutz, there are now no longer any aggravating factors as to the death of <coughs> Lieutenant Lutz. Which means, if we go back and examine the use of aggravating factors at gate two, the death of Lieutenant Lutz is no longer a capital eligible offense. Now, Lieutenant Schreier will have the opportunity to address this in just a moment with regard to the harmless error analysis. 
I only want to address this at this point, if I may, with regards to how it affected sentence appropriateness and how the lower court engaged in its sentence appropriateness. We identified, or we offered to the court, several possible scenarios which may have explained the panel's decision to award the death sentence in this case. One or two of the members may have felt that the death sentence was warranted for the killing of Joan Lutz because of the circumstances under which she was killed. But they may have felt that the murder of Lieutenant Lutz was aptly punished by life imprisonment. One or two of the members may have believed that the death sentence was appropriate for the lieutenant's death because he was Lance Corporal Curtis's superior, but that with regard to the killing of Joan Lutz, because there weren't the indications of premeditation that there were for the lieutenant, that with regards to her death, that life imprisonment was an appropriate punishment. One or two of the members may have even believed that the only way the death sentence was appropriate was because it was a joint killing. Under those scenarios, we know that the panel, was their decision as to death was not reliable in light of the fact that with hindsight, if you will, there's no longer an aggravating factor with regards to the killing of Lieutenant Lutz. While the killing of Lieutenant Lutz may appropriately be seen, while the killing of Lieutenant Lutz may be appropriately seen as an aggravator for the death of Joan Lutz, the fact remains is that instead of two capital murder convictions before the sentencing panel and before the lower court on remand to assess sentence appropriateness, there's now only one. We think that certainly affects not only what the panel did, as Lieutenant Schreier will address in the few minutes that I've unfortunately left him, but we also certainly think it skews entirely the sentence appropriateness determination by, made by the lower court on remand. The lower court on remand only addressed, or if, the lower court on remand, when it went back and discussed sentence appropriateness, said, go back and read what we wrote in 28MJ in 1989 as to why we think the death sentence was appropriate in this case. And if we go back and read what's in 28MJ, we see that the emphasis there was on the killing of Lieutenant Lutz an offense which we now know is no longer capital eligible. So again, we can't trust the lower court's sentence appropriateness decision to be reliable when it was based solely or based on the existence of two capital murder convictions and now there is only one. If there's no further questions, I'd like to turn the podium over at this time to Lieutenant Schreier. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Lieutenant William Schreier for the Appellant Lance Corporal Curtis. Your Honors, I will show that the CMR erred in conducting harmless error analysis in this case. That harmless error analysis, of course, was necessitated by the set aside of the third aggravating factor, as Commander Hall has mentioned. There are two parts to my argument. The first part is that harmless error analysis is inappropriate in this case. The second part is that even if you find that it's not inappropriate, the Court of Military Review erred in conducting the harmless error analysis here. Harmless error analysis, of course, is permitted by the Supreme Court's Clemens decision. It's not required, but it is permitted. However, Clemens forbids harmless error analysis when speculative appellate findings would be required to engage in such an analysis. And that's precisely what's required here, speculation. There are several reasons why speculation is required to conduct a harmless error analysis in this case, and I'll list a few of them. First of all, as Commander Hall has said, only one capital offense remains after the set aside of the third, third aggravating factor. When you remove one of the two foundation stones of this sentencing proceeding, you can't now go back and assess the impact of that error without speculating, without something that Clemens forbids. The second reason why harmless error analysis is inappropriate here is because the government emphasized the third aggravator in the guise of Lieutenant Lutz's killing. They asked the members to place emphasis on it, and they got what they asked for. The third reason is because in the military we have a unitary sentencing proceeding. We don't apply a sentence to a specific offense. We throw all the offenses into the hopper and one sentence comes out. So as Commander Hall has said, we don't know which offense Lance Corporal Curtis received the death penalty for. And that requires, once again, speculation. The fourth yeah, reason... Back, back during the earlier Curtis case, I had some difficulty trying to understand exactly the North Carolina case and, and our case that 
Chief Judge ever wrote dealing with this double counting. But if you use simple logic or simple mathematics, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking you to help me get through this, if I have a, a cup, I mean a, a, a glass and a cup, and I call that a glass and a cup, and you call it a cup and a glass, we could say that's two, two definitions of what those are. In other words, you have the murder of, of the lieutenant coupled with the murder of his wife, aggravating factor one. You had the murder of the wife coupled with the murder of the lieutenant, aggravating factor two. And Judge Everett said, no, that's double counting. But didn't what he really mean was there just that one glass and cup, cup and glass, there's, there's just one lieutenant and one wife, so it's one factor? You're not, but from the harmless error analysis, it's still the same homicides, any, no matter what you call them. Isn't that what he was talking about? Well, we said we, you can't, if you're adding them up, factors one, two, three, and four, you only have factors one, two, and three because you're double counting the two homicides. But in reality, you still have just the two homicides. So if you're looking at it from a harmless error analysis, don't you have the same thing? And no matter how you look at it? First of all, Your Honor, not all uh, violations of Article 118.1 are capital offenses. You must have an aggravator applicable to a specific offense. And when you but, remove... But what y'all are trying to argue, it seems to me, is that when he came in and killed the lieutenant, that was not a capital offense. When he killed the wife, that was a capital offense because he killed the lieutenant first. But that's not the law, is it? I mean, it, it's made a capital offense when he kills the second one. It doesn't, does it matter which one he'd kill first? Assume that we didn't have the first aggravator, Your Honor. We would have one aggravator in this case, yet two killings. But I it didn't matter which one was killed first, did it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter which, which one was killed first. You're so correct. So the fact that we called it two is harmless, isn't it? It is what it is, no matter what you call it. We don't know which offense he was sentenced to death for. He was sentenced to death for, for the offenses in the charge sheet. Let me... Uh, under, the, under your argument, under the unitary sentence, and he was sentenced for the offenses listed in the charge sheet which made him eligible to be sentenced to death under the law. If the offenses weren't there, he wouldn't have been eligible. If the aggravators weren't there, he wouldn't have well, been eligible. Well, for example, they'd found him guilty of one but not guilty of the other. That's only, that's only the first gate, Your Honor, because we have to have an aggravator for each offense. To, uh, as a hypothetical, suppose, for example, that someone was invited into someone's home. Uh, there was no felony underlying their entry into the home. And while they're in the home, they kill two individuals. You would have one aggravating factor in that case. I agree. And only one of those offenses would be a capital offense. And so that's what we have now, here. Uh, it's not just one of the offenses. It's the, uh, it's the maximum sentence in that case that's at stake. I, I guess the, the point is this. I mean, I guess you could try them separately. You could try the homicide of Lieutenant Lutz. And if he's found guilty, then two weeks later, you could then try the homicide of Mrs. Lutz and introduce evidence of the first one as the aggravating factor in the second one. And, and that becomes the capital murder case in the second one. But when you unify them together, it's the charges which he faces, which the maximum allowable punishment under the law is death. That's a reason why harmless error analysis is not appropriate here, because we don't know what impact the double counting had at, at the sentencing proceeding. It's, I, it's important. I, I'm trying to understand that argument, but. Well, let, let me, uh, I see that my time is getting short, but let me not leave this point here. It's, it's a fact that not all violations of 118.1 are capital offenses, Your Honor. You need to have an aggravator that is specifically applicable. Uh, as I hypothesized, there, there are cases where there may not be uh, other than one capital offense because two killings occurred there. If you set aside that one aggravating factor for whatever reason, then you would be left with no aggravators. You would have a case where there were no uh, capital offenses. So that, that is possible. In this case, well, by the look at it in a different way. What if the only charge, let's say that this uh, had taken place 
before Solario, and it happened off a post somewhere, and he'd killed the lieutenant. And then he'd killed the lieutenant's civilian girlfriend. So we don't have a dependent. Off base, no military connection except for the lieutenant. And you're trying him for capital murder. And you wanted to prove that the aggravating factor was that he also killed the girlfriend at that time and place. Wouldn't it be admissible? As the sole aggravating factor? Yes, I don't see why there would be a problem with it. Okay, now we're trying the girlfriend in the civilian community. And the aggravating factor is he also killed the lieutenant. The, the big case. distinction here is that we have one proceeding and we know that you cannot aggravate one killing with the other and vice versa. I mean, that's well settled. To aggravate uh, two killings with each other is violent of the law as it stands, Your Honor. And I think that's what... Uh, I thought what violated was counting it twice, just saying these are two factors. It's one factor, the double homicide. Right. But, I don't, I don't but see I'm, I'm, That's why I'm a little confused and I'm willing to try to consider what you're saying. But. I'm not sure that I can uh, clarify that point any further. Let me move on. Okay, to had they else. decided not to enter, not to convict him of the homicide of Mrs. Lutz in that case, couldn't they have still introduced her homicide as aggravating circumstances? For his killing, yes, absolutely, Your Honor. Okay. So it was harmless as far as that's concerned? Yes, Your Honor. But not when you brought in his killing to aggravate hers. That's where there's a double counting. And that's where the invalidity arose, and that's why uh, then Chief Judge Everett identified that issue, and that's why the lower court set aside that third aggravating factor. I mean, that's well established. And the government didn't uh, oppose that set aside of third aggravating factor. That's been accepted as correct. And so we're, we're here in a situation now where we have to assess the impact of that and whether, in the first question, we can even do it on harmless error review. I see that my time is getting very short. Uh, I would like to move on to the second uh, uh, part, and that is that the Court of Military Review engaged in harmless error analysis in this case inappropriately. First of all, we don't know what they did. They suggest, uh, they profess to have done harmless error analysis, uh, yet there is language in the opinion that suggests otherwise. They talk about uh, being convinced that the scale was not tipped by the invalid aggravating factor. That, of course, sounds more like reweighing than a harmless error analysis. It's important to know what type of analysis they engaged in because, Your Honors, you have to be able to review what it was that they engaged in. If you can't do that, then it's impossible to state that they did it, the, the analysis properly. I see them out of time. If I might just finish. Finish uh, that point. Go ahead. If they did harmless error analysis, let's assume that they did, Your Honors, there are two flaws with it. First of all, they didn't even acknowledge the fact that one of the offenses was no longer a death-eligible offense. Uh, Clemens and Sokor, of course, require principled discussion. Principled discussion should have had mention of that. And then lastly, if they did a harmless error analysis, their conclusion is hard to accept. How can they say that the members place no weight on the third aggravating factor when the government argued that third aggravating factor in the guise of the lieutenant's killing repeatedly? In conclusion, Your Honors, the remedy would be this. If you find that it's inappropriate to do a harmless error analysis in this case, you must remand back to the trial level for a new sentencing hearing. If alternatively you find that the harmless error analysis was done improperly by the court below, then a remand to them would be appropriate. May I answer any other questions? All right. Uh, at this time, uh, we will, uh, court will take a, a brief recess uh, for uh, five minutes. Court stands in recess. Good afternoon, Your Honors.
Commander Stallings, on behalf of Colonel Composto, Major Diaz, Lieutenant Ripple, representing the United States, may it please the court. This case arises from the brutal double murder of First Lieutenant James F. Lutz, 28-year-old Marine Corps officer, and his wife, Joan Halpin Lutz, age 28 years old, high school teacher and basketball coach. A young couple who were repeatedly stabbed to death on the early morning hours of 14 April 1987 in their married officer quarters at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And as general court martial, the was convicted of two specifications of premeditated murder, burglary, indecent assault, four larcenies, two housebreakings, damaging government property and failure to obey a lawful general order. The four officers and five enlisted members, three of whom were African American, American as is appellant, were unanimous in their verdicts of guilty to the pre, two premeditated murders, uh, unanimous in their finding of three statutory aggravating factors, and unanimous in their concurrence that appellants should be put to death. Thus, they were unanimous in their rejection of appellants' claim of racial prejudice with regard to Lieutenant Lutz. The first issue I'd like to address on behalf of the government is the ineffective assistance of counsel issue. The Sixth Amendment provides that in all criminal pr prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to have the assistance of counsel in the defense. In this first assignment of error before this court today, appellant places his trial defense team on trial, arguing that their representation was so <clears throat> ineffective during the court martial process that he was in fact, in, in essence, denied his right to counsel within the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. The government submits that nothing could be further from the truth. The Supreme Court, of course, sets the benchmark and the standard by which we review ineffective assistance of counsel issue in Strickland versus Washington. And, and that is a two-pronged test. One, that, that counsel's uh, performance was deficient, and that that deficient performance resulted in prejudice. And that prejudice was that, that we do not have a, a, a trial with reliable results. Counsel, do we also look at the Fretwell case? I'm sorry, ma'am? The Fretwell case? Lockhart versus Fretwell? Yes, ma'am. Don't do we also take that case yes, into consideration? Does yes, that change the, the formula no, at all? No, ma'am, it doesn't. The purpose, of course, of, of the Sixth Amendment, as, as defined and, and outlined in, in the Strickland opinion, is simply to ensure that criminal defendants receive a fair trial. Not the best trial, not the worst trial, but a fair trial. The court must indulge a strong presumption that counsel's conduct falls within the wide range of reasonable professional assistance. And that's, and that's the problem with appellant's case in this, in, this, in this case, your honors. They have failed to overcome that strong presumption. Well, counsel, in the context of this argument today, we focused, we focused on uh, the defense counsel's performance there at trial. Yes, sir. But in the larger context of this case, United States versus Curtis, from the beginning, Yes, sir. Haven't we been focusing in addition to the major's conduct that day and that week at Camp Lejeune? Haven't we been focusing also on the institution of military justice? Whether the military defense council has a necessary training, background, and experience to muster a defense in a capital case. Certainly that was one of the issues raised. I don't believe that's the folk that should not be the focus the it's ineffective not the, assistance. I know, but if we take that beginning of this case in 1989 or 88, 87, whenever our first case was decided, and now that we've looked at that, now we look at this council's performance in, in that context, we ask ourselves, as does Commander Hall, where were the seven witnesses on, on intoxication? Where was the 706 board? Where were they? Just not relevant? It's not relevant for one factor, sir. Well, the focus... You know, it, it shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't reasonable, shouldn't we have some evidence in the record that reasonable counsel trained and competent in capital litigation would have rejected intoxication on extenuation mitigation? No, sir. The you issue, don't think that's the issue, necessary? The issue before this court is was preparation of this defense counsel was the preparation and was the trial in this case 
was it reasonable? It, it makes no difference, sir, what you would have done at this trial, what I would have done at this trial in defense, what Commander Hall would have done in his rep but representation. But what's the first prong of Strickland? Is, is it deficient? And how is do you defense? define deficient? Is, is that outside the kin of a reasonable attorney, a reasonable, fallible attorney? And a reasonable, fallible attorney competent to defend a capital litigation case. Don't we Sir, have I don't to add that, that? I don't believe you find that in, in, in the language of Strickland versus Washington. Well, how, would it be, well, then it would be we could take a lawyer that's never tried a case and say, well, for a lawyer that's never tried a case, that was reasonable. Certainly that's a factor. That we would submit that was a factor that you can consider. However, we're, we're, well, we institutionally, have a institutionally, is that what we want to portray our capital defense as? I think what we want to portray our capital defense in the defense of capital litigants or appellants is we want to, to make sure that they're litigated, that those cases are litigated by experienced defense counsel. Certainly the problem here, sir, is but that wouldn't an this experienced was the first defense counsel have to have experience in, in defeating claims for the death penalty? He doesn't have to have experience. He, if he doesn't have the experience, it's, it's required upon him and incumbent upon him and the trial defense team to adequately prepare, to seek outside information, but to, which but is exactly all, what happened But if all here. of the experts in this area that the defense has presented in her brief say that, that any reasonable defense counsel would have presented a mitigation defense in this case. And they did, sir. They did, for, they, they did, they did in fact, put on a case, a case for life. The problem here is Which that they didn't, they didn't put on the case paragraph. for life that appellant would like you to, to believe should have been put on now. Yeah. That's well, the problem. And that goes right to, right to your own opinion, sir, uh, in United States versus Tharp at 38 MJ8. It doesn't matter that, that, that the appellant and his, his appellate defense counsels can after trial, and in, in this particular case, some seven and a half years uh, you know, looking back, it doesn't matter whether they can develop a new theory. This is exactly what happened in Tharp. He said, oh, we missed some, we missed some uh, uh, possibilities. There, there was some information that he might have been abused as a child and we should have put that on and that should have been the theory for the defense. But that's not what ineffective assistance counsel is all about. It's, was it reasonable? What they did at this particular trial, did they prepare themselves? Did they put on a case for life? And in this case, that's exactly what they did. That's the key and that's the focus. Not what I would have done, not what you would have done, not what some uh, civilian defense counsel in San Diego representing a civilian in front of a civilian court would have done. But what Major Boyette in the summer of 1987 did in front of a Marine panel of officer and enlisted members, given what he knew at the time of trial, that's the focus. Or what he should have known given a reasonable background investigation, that should be the focus, sir. Because to do anything other than that is, is to incorporate this, this evil of hindsight that the Supreme Court so, so dramatically and clearly warned us from doing in the Strickland decision. Counsel, it's, it's clear that the members rejected the theory or the strategy of manslaughter at trial. Yes, ma'am. Now, once that became clear, why, at mitigation, at sentencing, why wouldn't uh, a defense counsel bring in the intoxication issue? I can understand yes, why that they were conflicting strategies at trial, but now that we're at sentencing, why not try the intoxication theory? Well, there's two reasons for that, Your Honor. Number one, the intoxication defense, the issue of intoxication is simply a red herring in this case. There, there was, I mean, even if you look, we, we invite your attention to the 706 board in this case. Because what it says, if you look at it, is that all, all, the intox, all his drinking did on this particular occasion, it didn't, it didn't impair his ability to, 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 to uh, to, to uh, reasonably uh, in, intend to kill him. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with his cognitive abilities whatsoever. All it did is loosen his inhibitions. So first of all, it would be very inconsistent, especially given the overwhelming evidence that, that it didn't impair this individual at all. I think Chief Judge uh, Sullivan hit it right on the head. Look at the intoxication defense. Look exactly what we had in this case. We have an individual who who by many of the documents you have before him had been drinking for many years. Someone who had, who had, a, had a high tolerance for alcohol. But what did he do on the night of 13 April 1987? Well, he walked out of his barracks room, he looked at the supply hut, decided he was going to kill Lieutenant Lutz. And he knew exactly how he was going to do it. 
And he planned how he was going to do it. He knew he had to get into the supply hut. He got into the supply hut by breaking out one window. When he found out that he couldn't get it, have easy access, he went to another window and broke it out. He knew where the K-bar knives was, were. He knew how he had to get into that, that security cage, and he did exactly that. He took, very adeptly took a piece of, of flat metal and, and jimmied the lock and, and jimmied the hasp and got into the security cage and stole the knife, went back out, pushed a computer on the floor to make sure it looked like a, a burglary, climbed back out through the window. And as we know from, to, from, the, from the evidence of, uh, or the, the report of Dr. Engelstadter, the second set of psychological evaluations done prior to trial in this case, he told, he told Dr. Engelstadter, hey, I looked around. I made sure that no one else was out there who might try to stop me because I would have killed them too. Then what does he do? He goes back to his room, gets his gloves so he won't leave fingerprints, mixes some, mountain, some more Mountain Dew and, and gin to, I guess, to keep his courage up, knows he has to have transportation, tries to get, I believe it's Lance Corporal Moore to give him his car. When he wouldn't do that, he steals a bike rides it without any problems a mile and a half in the middle of the night to a place he's only been to twice. Then what does he do? He hides the bike all the time through his own, through his own, his own testimony at trial, all the time thinking and intending to kill Lieutenant Lutz and planning to kill Lieutenant Lutz. He hides the bike so nobody will see it. He scopes out the house. He goes all around the house to make sure to try to find out how many people are in that house and where they are. He uses a ruse. He says, hey, Lieutenant, Red's in a, Red was just in an accident. I need help. He gets in. He kills the lieutenant. He kills Mrs. Lutz and sexually assaults her. And then what does he do? He goes through the rest of the house to make sure there are no other witnesses. <clears throat> he wipes off the knife. He cleans off the murder weapon. He gets some money, try, steals one of the cars, tries to drive it around, realizes that he can't use a stick shift very well, goes back, steals the other car. And in fact, very interesting, makes sure that, that that both Lieutenant and Mrs. Lutz are dead, checks them out a couple of times, goes, steals the second car, the, the red Ford Tempo, and what does he do? He goes right over to one of the, one of the uh, battalion duty offices and tries to trick the duty NCO out of his revolver with two, two more ruses. Your Honor, we would submit that in the face of all this overwhelming evidence, all of it laid out at trial, to then stand up and say, but I was intoxicated, I didn't know what I was doing, would, would smack in the face of the members. But most importantly, that, that's one, one avenue, one aspect of this. The other aspect is, and if you look, we would, we've, we've offered in our, in our, in our brief uh, a law review article written by, by Dr. Goodpaster, Professor Goodpaster, uh, his 1984 uh, law review article on how to defend uh, uh, capital defendants. And one thing he talks about at length is trying to, to, to develop a common thread, not only during the, the merits phase of the trial, but also during the sentencing phase of the trial. And that's exactly what happened here. That's exactly what happened here. They developed that, he, that, that from all the background investigation that they did do, not only through the family, but through the Kansas uh, Social Rehabilitation Service, uh, and, all the other and all the witnesses that they interviewed through their own two sets of psychiatrists and psychologists, they were able to determine when, when all that evidence is taken as a whole, all that information is taken as a whole, that this was a quiet, shy, kind young man raised in a good Christian home. A good Christian home may have had some problems. No, no two ways about that. But I would suggest to you that many good Christian homes have some problems. And that he was driven to, this, uh, to, to these two murders, these two brutal murders, by the alleged racial prejudice of this, of this lieutenant. That went through from the very minute they, the, the, the court members came in and were voir dired, all the way through the five witnesses that testified live. You had, you had Staff Sergeant Teal who testified that Lance Corporal Curtis was a, about his good military uh, performance. You then had the, the chaplain, Chaplain Ruddle, who got, got on the stand and talked about the remorse of this appellant, even though we, we know from the record of trial, from the very disdain that he showed the family members at the trial, that he had no more, more remorse. Then we had three live witnesses. We had Mrs. Curtis, the, the adopted mother of the appellant, get on the stand. And not only did she testify on his behalf, but she read 30 letters and, and basically set up these 30 letters of, of approximately 40 people who, to a person, testified about the self-worth of this individual. And then we had his aunt take the stand, and then we had his best friend take the stand. 
All of this was consistent with the very theory that this trial defense team put on from the very beginning of this trial, from their, from their pretrial preparation, all the way through until the members stood up and announced the sentence to death. And that is what this court, we would respectfully submit, needs to focus on. Was that theory, was that theory reasonable? Not whether I would have put on an intoxication defense or someone else might have. Again, we would submit in the, with this overwhelming evidence against that, that, that to put on you know, the, the good Christian young man driven to, to, to the murders, uh, and then to turn around and say, oh, but I was intoxicated, would, would, would have been inconsistent, especially given the, the 706 board and, and Dr. Engelstadter's report where this really didn't impair him at all. Uh, and, then to, and then to try to just throw that in front of the members. We would about, suggest that's very inconsistent. How about, excuse me, but how about the statement, in, uh, as I understand it, in the 706 board that uh, if it hadn't been for his ingestion of alcohol, this probably wouldn't have taken place? Should, couldn't that have been helpful to uh, the defense on... Uh, it it might have been, sir. And if the defense counsel had requested an a, a instruction on the, by the military judge that uh, intoxication, voluntary intoxication, was a mitigating factor could be considered as a mitigating factor, would the defendant been entitled to that instruction? Well, in fact, he got the intoxication instruction on the, on the merits. I'm asking about in, as far as a mitigating factor, as far as... Yes, sir, he would have been entitled to it. Okay. So, assuming, and there was no instru instruction requested and no argument made whatsoever in the sentencing portion with regard to his intoxication. That's correct, Your Honor. And are those two necessarily inconsistent? I hear you arguing that the good, quiet, individual uh, who is driven by the racial slurs to this particular event is inconsistent with arguing that uh, there was intoxication involved. It doesn't seem to me like those two things are inconsistent. They might have been. I, I think the problem, sir, again, is, is, is standing up and saying that he was, he was you know, substantially intoxicated at all, given the things that he did and given the, the overwhelming evidence that, 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 that he wasn't intoxicated. I think that's the problem. But, but even, if, even if those things could have happened, Your Honor, the key here, the key here is, was the defense that was put on, was it reasonable? Again, I think that goes back to the hindsight. What could they have done? Everything was based on this particular theory. And of course, this particular theory, we know, was born out of the mouth of the appellant himself when he was first a apprehended by Trooper Addison that morning. Counsel, how do you, excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. How do you answer the argument that the trial defense team failed to adequately investigate appellant's background and that they apparently missed what appears to be now evidence of his abuse as a child? Well, at least there's alleged abuse uh, as a child. We, we would answer that, that, that this court should reject that. Uh, we'd ask the court to look exactly what, exactly what information was before the, the, the uh, trial defense team. Of course, don't, don't we back up a step from that and look at exactly what steps the trial defense team took to uncover that information? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I think that's, that's the key. Uh, if you look at cases like, like uh, Mitchell v. Kemp out of the, uh, out of the 11th Circuit, uh, which of course is based upon Strickland v. Washington. And in Strickland v. Washington, in fact, that was the issue. Uh, they claimed that the, that the uh, trial defense counsel did not do an adequate background investigation. And of course, the key to all this to a, large, to a large degree, the reasonableness of the investigation that's conducted, to a large degree, is based upon what the appellant tells the, the trial defense counsel. And, and, and I think that, 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 that is the, the, the foundation for your question, ma'am, because what did the trial counsel know from talking to appellant? Well, first of all, all this information that we know about him having self-worth, about being a good person, about coming from a good Christian home, about being able to play, uh, play the organ, about singing in the choir, about going to church regularly. That all came from the appellant initially. But then what did the trial defense counsel do? They talked to Mrs. Curtis. They talked to the aunt. They talked to Mr. Woods, Mr. Kenneth Woods. They corroborated what appellant told them. Well, but we didn't stop, but they didn't even well, stop back, there. Back to Judge Gerke's question. Yes, sir. Uh, if you give the defense team an A-plus for where they got don't they leave the court members high and dry? Well, why did he, if he's such a, uh, has this background and all of this, how could these racial slurs have precipitated such a horrendous homicide? 
Well, that's and then the, you, that's then the you key. go back, then you go back to the other evidence. It's overwhelming in the record from uh, Lance Corporal Moore, Lance Corporal Jones, and from a completely independent source, a North Carolina State Trooper, who says he was severely impaired. You've got uh, a 706 board. You probably could bring an expert in to say that uh, Mountain Dew has about three times the cocaine level as coffee and, and will activate gin twice as fast. I mean, you probably could do all kinds of things. I'm sure you could have, sir. Caffeine. What did I say? Cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Caffeine. I'm sorry. You said but anyway, sir, I didn't. I... Uh, but you see what I'm saying? I'm yes, saying, sir. Wouldn't a competent defense, having set up the foil, that this is a good Christian young man, now want to explain to the members why he went afoul? He did. They did explain that, sir. Oh, but it wasn't. But the problem is, is that what you're asking me is, should they have used another theory? No, no. I, I think it's I'm back to Judge Durkee's question. question. Wouldn't, wouldn't this intoxication defense and mitigation be consistent with an explanation as to why this particular and that's what this is all about? Should this individual be executed for his crimes? Yes, sir. And if the members have all of that information and said that's no excuse, execute him then I don't think anybody could, uh, could, unless they're opposed to capital punishment in general, would have any complaint. But now we only have half the picture. Well, we have a different theory, I think. Again, that might have been consistent. Again, that's a tactical decision not to do that. And, and, I, and I would suggest that that's a reasonable one based on all the, the, the evidence. I think the problem that we have, sir, is that out of the mouths of Lance Corporal, uh, Lance Corporal Moore and Lance Corporal Jones, we have, a, we have two people testify he was so intoxicated, and then 15 minutes after, after they see him, he does all these, you know, these litany of things that, that both the, the chief and judge and I, and I have We, had a, we had a case out at Fort Hood. A, a, a soldier broke into Hell on Wheels Museum out there, and he was found outside, passed out. Yes, sir. And, and the government was able to prove its case that he had the requisite intent by showing how complicated the burglary was. That's facts. But here you only have half the facts. Well, I'm not sure I understand what facts we don't have. Well, you're saying this proves he was sober well, because he could do all of these things. He could make all these rational decisions. He was therefore sober, so therefore all this evidence of his intoxication is irrelevant. I, I don't think that follows. I think part of the other problem is that, is that a lot of this, you know, should we have put on it, should they have put on an intoxication defense is based Again, looking, looking backwards, looking at the blood alcohol test uh, that was taken at, at 0730 the next morning. Yeah. Well, what we're trying to decide, as, as Judge Wiss started the question off, I think, was whether or not the particular tactic was reasonable and met the first yes, prong of Strickland, not, not that there's a better tactic. Yes, sir. I well, of course, your, your, your question is, is should, they have, you know, should they have put this on? But the important thing here, sir, is that there was a common thread in the defense that they did put on. You know, you ask, you ask me, well, why did he commit the murder? Uh, that's the common thread that runs through all this. It's, bo again, born out of the mouth of the accused. I did it because Lieutenant Lutz was prejudiced. And so that but proves that, beyond any reasonable doubt that it was premeditated. Yes, sir. But it's also... That's but not it, very good It's defense. more than that. It's, it's also the motive behind the murder. It's also the motive. That's, you ask me why, not if he had the intent. That's also the motive, why he did it. And, that, and that's a common thread that runs through this entire trial. Now, the fact that the members didn't, uh, didn't believe Lance Corporal Curtis and Lance Corporal Moore and Lance Corporal Jones, especially after the rebuttal witnesses got on the stand and said, I wouldn't believe Lance Corporal Jones, I wouldn't believe Lance Corporal Moore. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, there are six or seven of us that are African Americans, and our opinion of Lieutenant Lutz is that he would never, he's not a racist. He's, he's just the opposite. He does, I think one of the, one of the uh, enlisted witnesses testified that he didn't have a prejudice bone in his body. Uh, another one testified he treated me like a son. That's the reason that he was convicted. But your question to me was, why did he commit the murders? That's why he committed no, the murder. Not at least why did he one. commit the murder, but why did he act out of the character that you're... That well, and that's, and that's it. Th that's the theory that over this allegedly this long period of time of racial uh, prejudice. And I use the word alleged because the government doesn't... Uh, submits that that's not, not true at all that his self-worth was, was, was just like a brick, just chipped away little by little by little by little by little. And everything that was put on, Your Honor, whether it was successful or not, uh, built to that and continued to build in sentencing. 
Because again, what we had, we had more evidence of, of, of the appellant's self-worth. And that, you know, the, 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 the appellate defense counsel makes a lot about, well, the, the brevity of the final argument. But that's the crescendo. It comes down to that. You didn't believe it on sentencing, but that doesn't mean that you, that, that's not enough to want to make you spare this man's, man's life. It, counsel, it, goes, it goes on. Counsel, on the uh, ineffective assistance of counsel in the Supreme Court case of Strickland, uh, assuming arguendo that there should have been put on this, you know, a more emphasis on the intoxication defense, even though there's all this intricate planning and execution, which would have undercut that in the record, uh, and the uh, abused child uh, rejected, uh, rejected by the mother living in foster homes with problems, uh, that was not put on. Uh, That's correct, sir. Yeah, what, it, what it, the second part of Strickland says that these things that weren't put on, you know, or the air, would, have made, would it have made a difference before the jury? Yes, sir. And I wonder, uh, Mr. Bailey, F. Lee Bailey, one of the uh, foremost uh, defense attorneys, has, has indicated about the, the jury system in the military that is uh, probably the most intelligent uh, jury system, uh, or jury, you know, yes, you know, across the board, uh, the probably more educated than many jurors uh, throughout the country. Uh, uh, would it have made a difference to a jury like this? Ha had these about the, about the, the alleged maladjusted yeah, child. Yeah, had the abuse uh, excuse uh, been projected onto this jury, would it have made a difference? Uh, the government submits the answer to that is absolutely not, for two very important well, reasons. Before you say absolutely not, doesn't well, an intelligent jury in the, in the uh, hypothesis that they know all the facts? Yes, sir. Okay, so if they're missing half the facts, but they're sir, not intelligent. To, to make that statement, though, sir, we have to assume that the trial defense can't... The first premise we have to get over is, was there a reasonable background investigation done? And that's what I was trying to... Uh, what, what Judge Crawford asked me. What we don't... What we, what we didn't... What I didn't get a chance to finish, ma'am, was we had, we had a lot of things that showed that, that this maladjusted child didn't exist at the time of this individual's trial. And that's the, that's the key, because what else do we have? We, we know we, we have the family members who said, oh no, good, good individual from a good Christian home. We have the, 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 the friends, same thing. We have, most importantly, the accused, the appellant saying that. And then we have, the, we have two sets of psychological evaluations done, one by a military board, and when, when the, the trial defense counsels don't get the answer they want there, what do they do? They go out and hire their own civilian psycho psychologist, and he tells them the same thing, and then they do something else. They go, again, to the, to the state of Kansas, and they obtain a, a very detailed four-year report on this individual. And I'd like to read exactly what some of the comments out of that report are. Uh, you know, he was a... I think I just went, by, went past it. Uh, so this is was, what was available at time of trial. And that's what was provided to them, sir. And that's the key. You know, he was a good little boy. His, his emotional and, and physical needs are well met by this family. He's adjusting well in this family. Now, this isn't a, this isn't a snapshot of a day or two. What we're looking at here are, are, are uh, evaluations of this child and evaluations of the, of the, the soon-to-be parents of this, adopted parents of this child, over a period of four and a half years. And that's the problem. You know, we talk about this alleged maladjusted child. Well, the government would ask you to take a, a real good look at Dr. Phillips's examination of, of, of the accused, or of the appellant. This is now two years after he's been sentenced to death. This is the first set of psychologists, psychiatric, uh, psychiatric evaluations done by the appellate defense team. And it's very interesting what, what, uh, what they say. Most importantly, about this maladjusted family, this abusive family, uh, Dr. Phillips' uh, report says, in, quote, in general, Private Curtis has fond memories of his family life and speaks particularly fondly of his adopted mother. Now, this is, now we're not even at trial, Your Honor, or prior to trial. We're two years past the trial. And there's even more, more evidence. We also would invite your, your attention to the sworn affidavit that Mrs. Curtis gave now Four years after the murders, four years after the trial. Now we're, we're now we're to 10 June 
1991, where the appellate, uh, lead appellate defense counsel at that time uh, goes out and, and, and starts, starts getting more affidavits. And what does Mrs. Curtis say? Now, this is four years after the murders, four years after the trial. Uh, quote, Mr. Curtis and uh, an appellate got along real good. This is four years later. So that's the, that's the type of evidence, that's the type of evidence that we had, at the, that, that the trial defense counsels had at the time of trial, and it's with that focus that this court should, should judge the ineffectiveness of the counsel issue. Most importantly, it's very interesting to note you know, all the premises that, that, that surround this maladjusted child. Well, it's interesting to note that all these things don't come out really until the fourth set of psychological evaluations are done. Uh, now by, by Dr. Hans Selvog. Now we're in the 1991, where all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, appellant decides that, well, you know, I was sexually molested when I was 13 by some unknown man. Now, the government would submit, why, if, if this is the case, why didn't he provide this information to Dr. Phillips, to the 706 board, to, to Dr. Engelstad, to his, to his counsel, the very people that were trying to defend him for his life? That's the key here. And it's under that set of information that Major Boyette and Captain Lambert should be judged. Their, their actions should be judged. When you take all that into consideration with really the lack of intoxication, the question then becomes, is the defense that they put on, the theory that ran throughout the entire, entire uh, defense of this case, both on the merits and at, 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 on sentencing, was it reasonable? So, Chief Judge, you, you asked the question about, uh, you know, could they have put on this maladjusted, uh, uh, you know, would that have made a difference? Again, the problem with that is this. Certainly, it would, have, it would have been devastating to the defense with regard to the issue of voluntary manslaughter uh, with regard to Lieutenant Lutz. Because, that, because to, to get an instruction on voluntary manslaughter, that's an objective test. We have a reasonable person who's, who's, who's driven by adequate provocation. What the defense would like you to believe and what, what appellant would like you to believe now is that, well, I was maladjusted and I was hypersensitive to insult. I was hypersensitive to slight, but what that would have done is cut exactly away. It would have cut exactly away from the objective test, the objective reasonable person, and may very well have, have swayed the judge into not giving that instruction at all. Because what it would have shown is that what we really might have had here is somebody who's unreasonable, who unreasonably thought that Lieutenant Lutz was racially prejudiced, or even might have been. Cuts, a, cuts across, it cuts away from the defense's theory with regard to voluntary manslaughter on the merits. But it also has a very detrimental impact with regard to sentencing. And that's this. If we have an individual now who's, un, who's, who's unreasonable and who's basically a human spring trap waiting to, waiting to strike because he unreasonably perceives that you slight him, well, what does that really tell the members? That tells the members that he's even more dangerous than he was portrayed at trial, that he's even more, more a danger to society. And we would submit that would give them an additional motivation or an additional factor when they went back into that court and in that jury room and said, hey, this guy is, I mean, he's a menace. He, he, I mean, he's really a menace. I mean, it's not even a reasonable person here. We have an re unreasonable person who, even if he thinks unreasonably that he's being slighted, what does he do? He murders that person. So we would submit that, that, that in the analysis of prejudice, uh, even if that uh, line of defense had been put on, that it would it would not have changed the verdict at all. Yeah, well, even uh, actually, uh, uh, the the facts of the case go beyond just the person who slighted him, <clears throat> but the wife, and he's also stealing, Absolutely. and he's taking cars, and you know, I mean, all these things go back to I'm being I'm slighted, I'm irrational. Yeah, Absolutely, so. and most importantly, let's just, let's not forget. Uh, the in indecent assault upon uh, Mrs. Lutz as she lied dying as she was pleading for her life and actually calling the appellant by his name. Why are you doing this to us? We've never done anything to you. What have we ever done to you? Very important element to that, sir. Absolutely correct. Counsel, with the, uh, this, this big question of whether, whether or not it was trial tactics, and you make a very persuasive argument along those lines, <clears throat> 
and defense counsel to the to the contrary. Uh, the thing that bothers me is why didn't the defense counsel, when they presented their affidavits, present the argument as to uh, uh, th their failure to provide this information as a matter of trial tactics? I'm sorry, sir. Why, why didn't the why didn't the defense counsel? present the argument and the position that their, their procedure was consistent with their trial tactics. Sure they did. In fact, I, th I think if you look at, at, at Captain Lambert's affidavit, he says very clearly that when he's talking about Major Boyette, that Major Boyette had a theory, that that, and that theory ran through the entire case. That's exactly what they did do. They did talk about their theory. Uh, well. I'm sorry. That theory, basically what you're saying is they put all his eggs in that racial prejudice basket. Yes, sir. And when you take a look at the rebuttal witness that the government was able to present with regard to racial prejudice, and you take a look at the, um, the fact that that sort of blew that out the door, uh, it's, it seems to me like maybe he was ill-advised to put all of the eggs in that basket. Well, sir, again, that we, we can certainly come to that conclusion uh, looking back, looking with hindsight. And then you, you combine that with the fact that racial prejudice would not be any kind of a defense to uh, his murder of, of Mrs. Lutz. Absolutely. Well, there was a, and, 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 the, and, and, and the theory with regard to the murder of Mrs. Lutz was, was a little different. Certainly, we're, you know, what we've focused on here so far is the, is the premeditated murder of Lieutenant Lutz. But the theory with regard to Mrs. Lutz, Mrs. Lutz's murder was a little different. Uh, first of all, he didn't, you know, according to the, to the defense, he didn't, he didn't intend to kill her at all. Now, there, the theory at trial was that she was quickly upon him after he stabbed Lieutenant Lutz, that she quickly raced to Lieutenant Lutz's side and then quickly to him and kicked him, and that he didn't have the time to premeditate. That's the, def that's the theory with regard to, to the murder of Mrs. Lutz. It wasn't that, that she adequately uh, provoked him. I mean, how could she possibly have done that? When right out of the mouth of the, of the appellant at trial on cross-examination, he admitted that this, this, this good woman had never done anything to, to him in her, in her entire life. So it's a little different. No, I understand, but th that also militates against putting all your eggs in the yes, basket of saying, oh, he did all of this because of uh, the fact that he had been slurred racially in his unit from time to time. Yes, sir. It just doesn't... It, it just doesn't help him with regard, certainly, to the uh, murder of Mrs. Lutz, and that's all part of this, and it, and it didn't help him that much with regard to the murder, murder of Lieutenant Lutz in light of the fact that they were able to bring this person that lived with them, who said that the, and, and also a couple of uh, members of the unit who I indicated that there, he was not a prejudiced person. That's right, but, but it did one thing. It, it raised the specter of whether a reasonable individual could have perceived that. And that's what the involuntary, or excuse me, the voluntary manslaughter instruction is all about. The bottom line, Your Honor, you're, you're asking me, well, it wasn't, it wasn't successful. But if it, if it was so totally skewed and out of the, you know, out of left field, th then the government would ask the question, why did the military judge give the instruction at all? It certainly convinced him that there was evidence to that, to that element. And that, that element, of course, was, in, was part of the adequate provocation uh, wrong of voluntary manslaughter. So we would submit that it was reasonable. Uh, whether or not he it, it put, it, it put everything <coughs> in one basket, well again, this defense was born out of the mouth of the accused. When he told, when he told Trooper Addison, and when he, when he testified, uh, or when his confessions to NIS, where he says, you know, when I, when I was killing, when I killed Mrs. Lutz, you know, I was thinking that, you know, Lieutenant Lutz, uh, he treated me like a puppy. And I turned, I turned to him uh, after I'd stabbed her, and after I'd, you know, sexually assaulted her, and I said, you wanted a dog, here's your dog. That's all part of that, part of that. That's part of, the, part of that element. So we would submit that it, it, it certainly wasn't unreasonable, uh, especially when that's all you really, we would submit all you really had. You didn't, really, you didn't have an intoxication right. defense here at all, we would submit, even though the military judge did give that instruction. Well, I understand the, the uh, evidence that would militate against intoxication being a, a defense on the findings. I'm not sure that I understand the lack of bringing any of that information forward uh, with regard to sentencing. Sure. Yeah, following up on Judge Gerke, was there any explanation by defense counsel for the non-use of the voluntary intoxication as a matter of trial stack tactics in, in sentencing? 
I'm not sure that there was, Your Honor. Yeah. Well, but I think, the pro I think the problem with all this is we're putting the burden on the government. We don't, we don't know if they considered it a rejected. In fact, they did reject it. The problem is that's a, that's a question unanswered by the defense. They have the burden to show that what was put on at trial was, was, an un, was, was not a proper strategy, that it wasn't a tactical decision. Well, they haven't done that. Well, counsel, their argument is, and their briefs goes much deeper. They argued that, that uh, Major Boyette had not been trained in death penalty litigation. He didn't employ a psychologist to help him with this background investigation. He did it on his own. This, their argument is much deeper than just here's a lawyer that had it and considered it. It goes beyond that. In fact, they ask us to give money for them to hire these experts subsequent, as I recall, two or three years ago. And we ordered $15,000 to be made available to the defense to, to research various things. But let me switch horses a minute because I know your time's limited. Chief Judge Ed Byrne, and I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this maybe, wrote in his dissent that the United States Marines had not executed anyone since 1817, and he didn't think this case was the right one to start the practice anew. Now, two questions. First of all, isn't that proportionality? If no Marine has been executed, how can you say this would be proportional? That's well, one we question. We don't know the what, the other, what, what Marines he's comparing it to and what those... Well, he says none. Are. None. We would submit that that's strong evidence that this is extremely proportional. No Marine has been executed since 1817. Sir. Now, the second question, if that be true, what military necessity would the government argue that there is for the Marine Corps to impose the death penalty on Curtis? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear that. Is there any military necessity to impose the death penalty on Curtis? I mean, we have General Colin Powell after the, after the war in South and uh, in, in Asia there, uh, saying that this is the finest disciplined troops we've ever had. The Marines are very, very proud of their discipline and esprit de corps and simplify and all of that. Is the death penalty necessary in the Marine Corps? to instill good order and discipline? In this particular case, yes, sir. Or you, you want us to do it to, uh, for retribution for the family of the victim? No, sir. Uh, one of the key elements in this, in this heinous litany of crimes was the fact that a Marine Corps officer, a superior commissioned officer in the direct chain of command was murdered. Is this the first one that's been murdered since 1817? Well, no, sir. Well, so this one's not proportional to all those others. Sir, so what you're asking me is, is there, is there a military necessity? I'm there just is. asking you why all of a sudden in 1994 has it become important to the Marine Corps for us to affirm a death penalty case when they haven't executed anyone since 1817, if that's the case. And that's what, Ed, that's what Chief Judge Burns said. I'm, I haven't researched. Well, I believe his, his direct comments why he believed the, the death sentence was not appropriate is because he bought into this this racial, this, this racial, the racial overtones, as I believe he put it. I think he said, and also. Yes, sir. And also. You asked me if there's a military necessity here. There is a military necessity, but that's not the whole, that's not the whole, that's not the whole pie. That's only a, a, a portion of it. And we, there, are, there are many other, many other factors that go into why this particular case, you know, the death penalty is appropriate and proportional. That's just one sliver of the, of the whole equation. So what we really should be looking at is more a societal vindication that this is the kind of case, proportionately in society, the death penalty is warranted. Sir, I think it speaks volumes that this, that this is the first Marine uh, that has received the death penalty in that many of years. I think that shows the great restraint and the great pride that the United States Marine Corps has. And I, I don't know if there may have been other Marines that received the death penalty. I don't think Judge Byrne said that. He said none had been executed. He didn't Sir. say about whether they had received it or not. Yes, sir. Your Honors, with, with your permission, I'd like to move on to, to some of the other issues since I've spent about an hour on ineffective assistance to counsel. I'd like to turn my attention very briefly um, really to the double counting issue. The government, well, I'd like to make one stop along the way in doing that. The appellate defense counsel said that we don't know if the members unanimously came to a conclusion that all the aggravating factors, uh, statutory, all the aggravating circumstance, or excuse me, all the statutory aggravating factors substantially outweighed the mitigating factors. We don't know that that was unanimous. We would submit to, and, and, and in the same process, we, did, we don't know 
if the members understood that they had the absolute discretion, even if they found that, and even if they found that all the aggravating circumstances, not just the aggravating statutory aggravating factors, but all the aggravating circumstances, even if they found that that substantially outweighed the, the E&M evidence, that they still had the discretion uh, to, to spare this individual the death penalty. And, and appellate defense counsel says there's one little tiny line in, in, the, in the sentencing instruction which kind of hints on that. The government takes great issue with that, Your Honors. And I'd like to, with your permission, to read you portions of the, of the uh, sentencing instruction given by this military judge. He says, first of all, with regard to, to the issue of, of, of uh, discretion, you may adjudge a sentence of death only upon, only under certain circumstances. First, the sentence of death may not be adjudged unless all of the members of this general court martial find beyond a reasonable doubt that one or more of the aggravating factors existed. Number one. Number two, later the judge instructs, all of you must find that the same aggravating or aggravating factor or factors existed before a sentence of death may be adjudged. Goes on further and reemphasizes, if, however, you determine that at least one of the aggravating factors existed, then you may consider, along with other appropriate sentence or possibilities, whether a sentence of death should be adjudged. And finally, he says, I have advised you that the maximum punishment that may be adjudged, may be adjudged, is death. Bear in mind that the maximum punishment is a ceiling upon your discretion. Ceiling upon your discretion. Not that you must, if you come, if you get through, as, as the defense says, all the other gates, that you must impose the death penalty. It's absolutely clear when the military judge says, bear in mind that the maximum punishment is a ceiling on your discretion. You are at liberty to arrive at a lesser sentence based upon your own evaluation of the evidence presented. We would submit to you, Your Honors, that when you take that instruction, that sentencing instruction in total, it says several things. One, you must, all of you must find at least unanimously one, ag one statutory aggravating factor. Two, you cannot impose the death penalty. You can't even consider it unless you find, and, and unfortunately, the, the, you know, it doesn't say all of you find, it says you find that at least one of, at least that, that they outweigh the, the E and M. But then they go on, to, the judge goes on to say, it must be unanimous. It would, it would seem, it, it's just implausible that you would have a majority, you, would, you could have, positive, given the, 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 the instruction as a whole, that you could have a simple majority find that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating and, and extenuating circumstances knowing that that's the only basis that they can possibly even come to vote for the death penalty and then unanimously vote for the death penalty. It's just inconceivable. And in fact, this court, I believe in its first Curtis opinion, uh, noted that the, that the members had no confusion with the instructions in this case and had no, had no confusion with what their responsibilities and their discretion w w was in this case. Yes, sir. A uh, question with regard to the uh, appellant's argument on aggravating factors. As I understand their argument, uh, they are indicating that the three aggravating factors that were originally found that with regard to Mrs. Lutz's murder, there was a burglary uh, done in conjunction therewith and that Lieutenant Lutz was murdered in conjunction therewith. And then with regard to Lieutenant Lutz's murder, there was the murder of Mrs. Lutz was the aggravating factor there, giving th three aggravating factors. Because of the determination of this court uh, that that constituted a double counting, my understanding is that the court reduced the number of aggravating factors to two. They, as I understand it, are arguing the one that was dropped out was the one that pertained to Lieutenant Lutz, leaving two aggravating factors with regard to Mrs. Lutz's murder and none with regard to Lieutenant Lutz's murder. Do you read the opinion the same way? Absolutely not, Your Honor. And th there's also a very basic flaw in that argument. First of all, I have exactly what the, uh, uh, at page 534 of the lower court's opinion, uh, they don't just chuck out the third element. Basically, they say that it's, in fact, they, they, I quote, in our view, the second and third aggravating factors are simply identical. Basically, they, they, they put them together. I assume they said, it's your argument that that does not render the murder of Lieutenant Lutz non-capital as no, argument. Sir. Okay. No, sir. And, and, the re and there's a reason for that. Again, there's a basic flaw in, in the appellant's argument. He says, well, you know, you can't conduct a harmless error analysis because of that. Well, there's one big problem with that, sir. You know, the, the appellant talks about the gates. 
First gave us that you had to find the aggravating factor, at least one statutory aggravating factor unanimously. They found that. They found three of them. Okay. But what does that, if I can use the word loosely, entitle the members to do? It gets them, it, it gets them in the door, and that's all it does. It gets them in the door to whether or not they're going to consider the death penalty at all. The problem with the, with the you know, you, you look at the appellant's uh, brief about the, the balancing, you know, that that would have tipped the balance. It didn't tip the balance at all. And that's why this court can be confident that, that, that even if you have a double counting here, that, that you can conduct and, and affirm this sentence to death under a harmless error analysis. Because here's the problem. The, the aggravating factor is like a key, like a key to an apartment. What you had below with the, with the sentencing instruction by the, by the judge is you had three keys to that apartment. Any one of those three could have, keys could have opened the door. And what the members found is that all three of them opened the door because they voted unanimously on all three of the aggravating factors. What the lower court in this particular case says is that, no, 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 you don't have three keys to that apartment. What you really have is one key to that apartment and you have the, comp the apartment complex master key to that apartment. The important thing, Your Honor, is that whether I have two, three keys or two keys, I get through the door if I'm the members. And all that does, all that does is get me in a position where I can consider whether or not the death penalty should be awarded in this case. But it goes beyond that. I'm in the door now. The question then becomes is, did they have any information in front of them that they wouldn't have had if you throw out this aggravating factor? The answer is absolutely not. They had the exact same amount of evidence. That's the problem with the defense's, that, that's the second part of, of, of the flaw in, in, in appellant's argument. The evidence they had, all the aggravating circumstances, not only under 1004C, but also under 1001B4, is, 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 is game for their considerations. And none of that changed. Still have the two, bur two murders and a burglary. Absolutely. And you still had the indecent assault and, and the, the house breakings and the, and, and the larcenies. None of that changed. So, you know, appellant asks you, well, would the finger have been, you know, lifted from the scale to tip it? There was no finger removed because the evidence wasn't changed. All we had, as I said, instead of having three keys to that apartment, we have one key to that apartment and a master key. That's what we have, even under this, under this double county. And that's why... The government would submit that this, this court can confidently conduct a harmless error analysis and find that beyond a reasonable doubt, the doubling up of the second and third aggravating factors are harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. I'd like to move very quickly with the court's permission to, to proportionality review. And since my time is, is short, I, uh, the government would like to, to, to just say one thing before it goes into its actual proportionality review. The government submits that, certainly we're, we're, we're completely aware of this court's decision, United States versus Loving, where this court defined, basically re, reiterated the scope of the proportionality review. A general, uh, limited, uh, uh, comparative proportionality review. But we, we asked one thing, very, very quickly, sir, your honors, and that is, the one thing that, that the loving uh, counsel did not argue in front of this, this, this august panel was whether or not a, a, a proportionality review should be conducted at all. And I, I don't mean to quibble with the court or take the court on, but we, we suggest that, that Judge Crawford's uh, dissent in your 14 April 1992 order in United States versus Murphy is exactly correct. That this court shouldn't even, cut, it, we shouldn't even be doing a proportionality review for three very quick reasons. One, there's no express language in Article 66C which requires it. Two, this court's own precedence shows a disfavor generally with proportionality review. And number three, proportionality review is not constitutionally required if the, the capital sentencing scheme adequately channels the discretion of the members of the jury. And we would ask, invite this court's attention especially to, to Jurek versus Texas. Because the Supreme Court upheld a capital sentencing scheme which did not require a proportionality review in the statute because of that channeling. 
We would only submit that, that that's important because the safeguards in the military capital sentencing scheme are, are more pervasive and more extensive than you find in, in the Texas capital sentencing scheme. Again, I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, even if this court were to, were to not take up the government's invitation, certainly the, the court has al already uh, decided what the, what the scope of that proportionality review should be. Looking at, the, looking at the Navy Marine Corps court's proportionality review in this case, Pellin argues that, that the, the Navy Marine Corps didn't follow this court's order. We would again take great, uh, great umbrage to that. The Navy Marine Corps court did three things. First of all, and this is one of the basic problems, I think, with, with conducting a proportionality review at all. They considered post Furman cases, death penalty cases that the Supreme Court uh, considered. But the problem that you have is, and I think Judge Wiss talked about this in his dissent in Loving, is what elements do you decide? You got a lot of elements here. You got a lot of, lot of factors that, that go into the mix in this case. You have two murders. You have an indecent assault. You have a larceny. You have a housebreaking. You have a burglary. You have the murder of someone in authority. And I would suggest that it goes even beyond uh, Judge, Judge Crawford's uh, recommendation that you could only compare the element of uh, a superior commissioned officer in the chain of command with, with that of a, the murder of a policeman or a, a, an official, a government official, for one very important reason. In this particular case, this appellant murdered his superior commissioned officer, someone he worked for. We would submit that, that, that even, a, even a, a closer and a tighter knit analysis would be that we have a police officer murdering his superior commissioned police or his superior uh, police officer in his chain of command. Because we don't have somebody who just shot somebody out on the street that he didn't know. We have someone who directly affected the good order and discipline and morale of this particular unit by his, his heinous actions in this case. So that's, that's the first problem is what elements do we consider? Well, there are a lot of Supreme Court cases with regards to murder that have been reviewed. Double murder cases. Well, we don't have any Superior Commission officer murders here. We have a single murder over here where you have a government official or police officer. Over here we have a, a, a murder and a burglary. Over here we have two murders and a burglary or two murders and a robbery. You know, where do you draw the line? I think that's the first problem with the proportionality review in general. So the, so the court we would submit that below did not did not diverge from this court's order to consider death penalty cases affirmed by the Supreme Court. Second of all, this court's own decision in, the, in this very case at 32 MJ 270 uh, entreats the court to look at cases uh, that this proportionality review could include but was not limited to death sentences from the accused own service or even the death sentences imposed by court martial. That's what this very court said. And certainly that's exactly what, this, what the Navy Marine Corps Court did when it, when it looked at, at, at post 1 August 1984 uh, death penalty cases in the military. And third, the government would concede that the Navy Marine Corps Court did in fact go beyond the order of this court when it considered non-death penalty cases, 10 of them. The answer to that, without being flip, is that the answer is they, didn't need to, they did not need to consider any of them. To consider any non-death penalty cases in this mix inures to appellant's benefit. And most importantly, it was done at the behest of the appellant. The appellant's argument really isn't that they didn't consider non-death penalty cases. It's just that they take umbrage with the fact that they didn't consider enough for their, for their liking. We would submit that, it, that when, this, when this proportionality review is looked at in total, that if there's any error here, that error inured to appellant's benefit. And, and certainly, uh, when that's done, there's absolutely no doubt that this case is proportional to, to those cases. In fact, uh, Judge Wiss, you asked, sir, if, 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 the, uh, if the appellant had the opportunity to, to cite cases and put cases before the Navy Marine Corps Court of Military Review. Uh, the answer to that, of course, is yes, as, as did the government. Uh, the government, if you look at, look at our brief, tried to focus on some of the, the elements. It's very difficult to find a double murder, a sexual 
assault or a sexual, sexual offense uh, and to try to find somewhere in there as well the murder of, of, a, of a superior or, or an official uh, figure. It's very difficult because we would submit that these case, this case is so heinous that, that thankfully for our society we're not going to find very many of those. But we are going to find cases with, with cert, certain of those elements. And we would submit to you, sir, that, that the Navy Marine Corps Court certainly considered our brief and our brief is the same, to a great extent, the same cases that we've cited before this honorable court. So there's, there's, and there's and nothing that was that done regard, with their eyes closed. I guess this is the point to be made, sir. In that regard, counsel, you, you distinguished the, the uh, authorities that were offered by the defense, as I recall. I certainly tried, sir. Did you go beyond distinguishing that to any additional cases? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, did, but did you limit your, your uh, argument on that to distinguishing the cases that the uh, defense presented? What, what we did below, Your Honor, and, and what we just very briefly would like to say with regard to proportionality in general in this case is that, number one, we distinguished the defense cases below. And, and, and then, of course, we offered our own what we considered universe based on this court's order uh, in the two Curtis opinions. Yes. Uh, the important thing is is first of all, if you look at if you look at the appellant's proportionality review, they're all non-death penalty cases. We would consider that's very interesting, considering this court ordered that the proportionality review was was to be done with only death penalty cases. So that that was what was offered below, and that's what's offered before you today. Uh, we would submit that the government didn't do that. We offered you death penalty cases with as many of these elements as we could possibly find that are found in this case. With regard to the proportionality review itself here, appellant takes a very interesting tact. They say that there are five different factors that you ought to consider. And what they've tried to do in this case uh, is they say, well, we got this one case over here, and it's more brutal, we suggest to you, than the brutality in this case. That person didn't get the death penalty. Therefore, my client shouldn't get the death penalty because it's disproportionate. What we have over here is, we have a couple of cases where we have a single murder. Uh, the appellant talks about the Garraway case. That's a single murder. There's no sexual assault. There's no larceny. There's no burglary. There's no murder of the Superior Commission. I'll take it back. There is a murder of a Superior Commission officer, but that's all we have. He says, but, but, there was a, but there's an officer who's murdered. He didn't get the death penalty. My client shouldn't get the death penalty. The problem with that analysis is that in this case, in this capital murder case, we have all those factors. We have, a, including one that they didn't address, and that's the number of premeditated murders. We have all of those factors here, and we would submit that in that light, all of the cases that appellant has offered to this court to say that this death penalty is disproportionate pales in comparison to the elements that are found in this case. In that respect, we would submit to this court that the proportionate that this case is certainly proportional with the cases that we have cited for this court. Very briefly, Your Honors, and I know my time is getting very narrow. Maybe I have more time than I thought, but I but I would like I would like to, to to basically go on to the last. I, I'll try my best not to take up all the time if that's the case. I didn't realize I could get through it this fast. Uh, I, I but I'd like to address, I'm sorry, ma'am? I don't mean to rush you. Thank you, ma'am. That'll give me a chance to, to talk about the last issue in this case. Uh, and that's the issue of sentence appropriateness. If all the other hurdles are clear, and you go back to deliberate, and the last issue you have to consider is, is the death penalty in this case appropriate? The government would submit to you that without a question, your answer should be yes. As this court is well aware, this court may review appropriateness of sentence as a matter of law only to prevent obvious miscarriages of justice or abuses of discretion. The relevant question is whether the action of the Navy Marine Corps Court in approving the sentence in this case was arbitrary, capricious, or one which no reasonable person would have taken. We would submit to you, Your Honors, that, that a review of the thousands of pages of this record, both the record of trial, and as appellant has asked you to do, the appellate record, that a review of all those pages can lead to only one inescapable and logical conclusion. 
that the lower court's decision to affirm the death penalty and the death sentence in this case was not arbitrary or capricious and was in full accordance with the law. In fact, the, courts, the lower court's descriptions uh, that the crimes committed by appellant were outrageous and heinous was not a consideration of an impermissible statutory aggravating factor as appellant offers this court, but simply a statement of appellant's monstrous misconduct on the, morning of 14, on the early morning hours of 14 April 1987. The government submits that Senior Judge Strickland of, of that honorable court below could very well have, have, have used words such as brutal, vicious, vile, despicable, and cowardly. For those words also accurately describe appellant's level of criminal culpability in this case. The government again or, and, and, and respectfully entreats this court to first look at the element of premeditation. Now, appellant says premeditation was very, very slight in this case. Well. First of all, we have premeditation, but we, we know something else from this record. Number one, we know that at a minimum, at a minimum, this appellant premeditated the murder of Lieutenant Lutz for three hours. Minimum. His own testimony says that he broke, in, he broke into the supply hut with the intent to kill Lieutenant Lutz about 2300. He also testifies that the murders actually occurred, and so does the expert uh, that the government brought Let's talk about the time of death of the, two, of, of the two victims at approximately 0 to 100. That's a minimum of three hours. That's why we would submit, going back earlier, that, that the, the extrapolation of the intoxication level uh, that the defense offers you is skewed. It wasn't taken eight to nine hours after he, was, he, was, he committed these murders. It was at most five and a half hours. But we know something else about the premeditation in this case. We ask you very, uh, to, to take a, a very hard look at Dr. Engelstadter's report, which the appellant has offered this court, because it's something very interesting pops out. In that report, he, he reports, when he writes it down, that this appellant told him, during this psychological evaluation, that he first thought about killing Lieutenant Lutz in December of 1986. That's four months prior to the murders. Not, not a couple of minutes, uh, as appellant would, would, would somehow like you to believe, but four months. Premeditation, there's plenty of it here. There's been a lot of words bantered about, about you know, one side or the other, about the issue of racial prejudice in this case. And the government would ask this honorable court to look for the element of racial prejudice from Lieutenant Lutz. We submit you won't find it. Uh, as, as all the honorable judges have, 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 have said, we, we'd ask you to take a look, first of all, uh, at, at the testimony of Special Agent Young. Even there, appellant hedged his bet with regard to this uh, racial prejudice issue. He says, uh, yes, Lieutenant Lutz was prejudiced, but not enough that I would want to kill him. That's at page 516. But look at what Lieutenant Lutz really did in this case. First of all, we know that, as appellant would, would like to look in a, in, in a vacuum, he didn't just call the Lance Corporal Curtis by nicknames. He called, he called him several nicknames. We know something else. We know that, the, that, that his, his jeweled prize in that supply department was, a, was an individual by the name of Corporal Aurelia. And he called Corporal Aurelia some nicknames. He called him Johnny O. He called him Fuzzy-Headed Foreigner. And we know that he had nicknames for other individuals in that command. So first of all, we know that, that the lieutenants didn't single out Lance Corporal Curtis. What did the lieutenants really do for Lance Corporal Curtis? Well, first of all, he put him in a position of responsibility. He put him in the supply office. He wasn't one of the warehouse guys out in the back who moved all the boxes around. He put him in a responsible position and was, and was training him to use the computer. And, a, and the appellant himself says, on on cross-examination, yeah, he did that for me. He put me in, this is, a, this, is a, this is a highly skilled position. He put me in this responsible position. But what else do we know about Lieutenant Lutz? Lieutenant Lutz also tried to get this appellant promoted. And one of the sergeants, uh, the name escapes me, says, well, his, his marks just weren't high enough. But he tried to get him promoted. What else did Lieutenant Lutz do? Lieutenant Lutz, if you take a look at, 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 at all the, the uh, defense exhibits in this case, you also find that under Lieutenant Lutz, this appellant's 
proficiency and conduct marks went up. Not down, not, not, not down, but up. Look at the testimony of the African-American rebuttal witnesses offered by the government on this issue of racial prejudice. Mr. Mickens, who lived with them for three months, they treated me like a son. Lieutenant James, unquestionable. Lieutenant Lutz was not prejudiced toward blacks. Sergeant Price, Lieutenant Lutz wasn't prejudiced. First Sergeant Floyd, I don't think there was a prejudiced bone in the lieutenant's body. And finally, First Sergeant Jones, Lieutenant Lutz wasn't prejudiced toward black Marines. The government says in offers to this course, so how do you explain Lieutenant Lutz's actions when you look at the record of trial? First Sergeant Jones sums it up best. He was too close to his Marines. A racist, we would suggest to you, never. The evidence reveals that Lieutenant Lutz made the same honest mistake that thousands of other junior officers have made through the decades. He just wanted to be one of the guys when he was with his troops. And we know that that's not right, but, but that's an hum, that's a, that, that's a entirely human thing. He wanted to be able to talk their talk and walk their walk and fit in with them more. Certainly, many, many junior officers do that. We would submit to you that's, that explains his action. The element of brutality. Certainly, there was plenty of brutality here. Uh, Lieutenant Lutz, of course, was stabbed twice. How brutal it must have been for him to, to, to be stabbed twice as he tried to help a fellow Marine that he thought uh, was in need. You know, the red's, at, red's outside somewhere. He's just been in an accident. Let me help you, Pellant. How brutal it must have been to, to, to call for his wife knowing that she was in peril, and how brutal it must have been to see her stabbed eight times and then before his death sexually molested before his eyes. Brutality? There's plenty of brutality in this case. Now, Appellant alleges that his new evidence should sway this court just as it swayed it. Just, uh, we would suggest that, it, that this evidence should not sway this court just as it did not sway the court below. Appellant's level of lucidity was certainly not impaired by his alcohol consumption. All the litany of things that he did. And, and, and most importantly, not all the things that he was able to do physically, but cognitively. All the decisions that he made at every step of the way. When I was in that supply shack, I thought, I've gone too far to turn back. When I was riding on the bicycle to the Lutz's house, I said, I've gone too far to turn back. When I hit the bicycle, I've gone too far to turn back. He made a conscious decision every step of the way to murder the lieutenant. No, Your Honors, the gin that, that, that he mixed with Mountain Dew that night only gave this cowardly appellant his courage. And what if, again, his oversensitivity to insult, if that's true, if that portrayal of this appellant is true, as we've stated before, it simply uh, shows how dangerous he is. Your Honors, the uh, appellant has always contended in this case that he is the third victim. He is not. There are three victims in this case. The first is Lieutenant James F. Lutz. The second victim in this case is Joan Halpin Lutz. And the third victim in this, this case are their family and friends. Because those are the individuals who will never be able to see him again, and those are the individuals that will never be able to share their joys and triumphs. This was an act of vengeance and revenge, pure and simple. That's the analysis of Dr. Engelstadter, the defense expert, one of the defense experts that examined this appellant. Finally, Your Honors, we would like to leave this court with, this, with this, this particular phrase, because we would submit that appellant in this case said it all when he told Dr. Engelstadter, quote, sometimes you make your own justice. That's what I did. I made my own justice. Uh, the government submits that this appellant has richly earned his justice, and that that justice will be achieved when this court affirms the findings, and most importantly, sentenced to death in this case. Your Honors, this case, this brutal case, this brutal murder calls for the death penalty, and we ask this court to answer that call, affirm the findings, and sentence in this case. Thank you very much, Your Honors, for your, your attention. Thank you. All right. There's no further questions from the bench. Uh, court stands in a brief recess for five minutes. When we come back, we will uh, hear the rebuttal. Uh, you have 15 minutes for rebuttal? All right. Recess for five minutes. All rise.
United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is now open and in session. You may be seated. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. It seems as though the government wants to have this case both ways. It stood before you today, as it has mentioned in its briefs time and time again, and claimed that the trial defense team was effective for electing and using the theory that it did. And then in virtually the next breath, it stands before you and points out the flaws in the trial defense team's argument and the trial defense team's presentation. On the one hand, the government claims that the trial defense team was effective for using a voluntary manslaughter theory as to the racial slurs. And then on the other hand, it points out to the court why that theory didn't go anywhere. We find that inconsistent, and we hope the court shares us in finding that that is an inconsistent position for the government to take. Now, the government cited to the court the case of United States versus Tharp in 38 MJ. We would point out to the court that this court concluded in Tharp that the accused, Tharp himself, was making misrepresentations and that we couldn't trust collectively what it was Tharp was telling his counsel at any point in time. We would say to this court that there is no evidence whatsoever that anyone at any point has deliberately lied about Lance Corporal Curtis's background. We would submit that the only person who has called Lance Corporal Ronnie Curtis a maladjusted, defective individual is his own trial defense counsel in an affidavit which is over twice as long as his sentencing argument before the panels in an effort to save his client's life. That is the only individual who has called Lance Corporal Curtis a defective, maladjusted individual. Now, the 706 board told that trial defense team up front that Lance Corporal Curtis had little insight into himself. Why would his defense team then think that he was going to be a treasure trove of open information about his childhood. As we stated earlier, the lower court specifically found that it appeared that the family was being open and honest and responsive. So why were they open and honest and responsive to Hans Selvog, the psychosocial expert? It's because Hans Selvog knew what questions to ask. Now we submit that is much a factor of the trial defense team's inexperience as it is anything else. We are certainly not advocating that they treated their duties with anything less than due diligence, but they certainly did treat their duties with a great deal less than due competence. Judge Cox pointed out that the United States Marine Corps has not executed one of its own since 1817. And yet we, universally, both civilian and military alike, regard the United States Marine Corps as the finest of all four branches within the Department of Defense. And yet they have managed to be the finest in terms of good order and discipline without feeling the need to execute one of its own to get there. We would point out that there is a Marine case in that proportionality pool, United States versus Gibbs, a Marine who received the death sentence. But was that death sentence ultimately approved? No because the convening authority set aside the death, the death sentence in Gibbs's case. This ties back to our IAC argument, Your Honors. One of the factors why the convening authority in Gibbs set aside the death sentence in that Marine's case is because his trial defense team submitted a clemency package of over 100 documents. Now, the lower court here found that the trial defense team submitted voluminous materials on clemency. Go back and read that record, Your Honors. There was a page and a half letter submitted by the Trial Defense Council to the convening authority. It wasn't even signed by both counsel. Why? Because the second seater, Captain Lambert, had already rolled off of active duty. In fact, he was released from active duty within two weeks at the conclusion of Lance Corporal Curtis's court-martial. Now, why is that time significant? If we turn on the TV today, we'll see how many weeks it takes to seat a panel, to seat a jury, in certain civilian cases. And yet we can look at Lance Corporal Curtis's court martial in 1987 and see that that Marine was convicted and sentenced to death within 115 days of his offenses. And two weeks afterwards, the second counsel leaves active duty. Systemically, we must, as a military justice system, have a problem with that. 
We must be able to afford our sailors, our soldiers, our airmen, and our Marines quality representation. And we submit that that is not what Lance Corporal Curtis received in this particular case. Now, the government stood before you and repeatedly emphasized the facts surrounding the killings in this case. But try as I may, I cannot recall him ever directly answering this court why the Trial Defense Council did not present evidence of voluntary intoxication on sentencing. As I stated repeatedly several hours ago when I was first before the court, if the court finds that the, def the defense theory was reasonable on the merits of the case, that still doesn't answer what happened, or should I say didn't happen, on sentencing. We've asked in our brief this court to set aside Lance Corporal Curtis's death sentence in order to remedy the ineffectiveness of his trial defense team, which was particularly egregious on sentencing. Capital litigation has come a long way in the military in seven years. But on the basis of this record, Lance Corporal Curtis should not be the guinea pig for effective representation in capital cases. Just yesterday, at the appellate defense shop, we received a capital case resulting in a life sentence, which consisted of 22 volumes and a record of 4,100 pages. Now, certainly the length of a record, comparing one against another, isn't a measure of effective representation. We're not submitting that. We are simply stating that if one objectively reviews the quality of representation provided to Lance Corporal Curtis in 1987, we see that by those standards back then, his representation was, I shouldn't say pathetic, it was ineffective. Again, this is not a personal vendetta of myself or the other members of the appellate defense team against the Trial Defense Council. They were a victims of their own inexperience and the fact that they did not recognize what it is they needed to do. And yet what they've submitted to this court, or submitted to counsel who have in turn submitted to this court, are affidavits where they say, I don't remember what our theory was on the merits, or excuse me, on sentencing, but I know that it was the bulk of our case. We'd invite the courts to read the uh, second Cedars affidavits, Captain Lambert's first and second affidavits. This was the same individual who tried hard, but on sentencing went to Mrs. Curtis and said, just get me letters from everybody in the world. In sum, as far as the ineffective assistance of counsel issue is concerned, we have here a trial defense team who, again, through their inexperience, shifted the burden of proof onto the accused by saying, make us prove Lieutenant Lutz was a racist, prejudiced individual, called his own client an animal to the panel, despite frequent, frequent articles and treatises emphasizing the need to humanize the client. He never made a single objection through the testimony of 19 prosecution witnesses, and he skipped cross-examining key government witnesses, including the pathologist, Dr. Almeida. Now, we think that's significant because it appears from Captain Lambert's notes that it was Dr. Almeida who may have suggested to the trial defense team that Lance Corporal Curtis's BAC was as high as a .26 at the time of the killings. This is the same trial defense team that ignored evidence of intoxication, which we have discussed in such detail today, even though it was the government's own 706 board who regarded this as the catalyst for the offenses. This is the trial defense team that treated sentencing like it was just another unauthorized absentee case, even though the comments and the affidavits from two experienced trial capital practitioners that we've submitted to the court argue to the contrary. And then finally on sentencing, this is the trial defense team who argues for all of about two pages in the record of trial, all of about 14 paragraphs, maybe six minutes, certainly a shorter period of time than I've stood before you today, in an effort to save Lance Corporal Curtis's life. And then finally, when this court-martial is all over and done with within 115 days, he writes a page and a half letter to the convening authority where he says that the victim brought all of this on to himself and finally goads the Marine General who was the convening authority in this case by saying only God can take a life. And guess what, General? You're not God. When I commenced my argument several hours ago, I said that this case is about reliability. Let me leave the court with this analogy. Imagine a ship under construction, a new design, the first in its class. The builders have never used the blueprints before and they scratch their heads when it comes to figuring out what some of the instructions are. They rush to get the ship into the water in a hurry, and in doing so, 
they use bad steel and the keel of the ship. Not surprisingly, once the ship is launched and in the water, it initially floats. Then leaks start springing, starting at the keel where the bad steel has been placed. The damage control team is called away and starts patching and shoring and pumping up the leaks. However, their efforts are in vain because of all the flaws which were built into the ship at the yards, which so affected the ship's watertight integrity. Integrity, in the sense of completeness or soundness, is missing in this case, too. We believe that an analysis of the errors in this case, particularly the Council's ineffectiveness on sentencing, shows that the integrity of this case cannot be relied upon. If there's no further questions, Lance Corporal Curtis, Lieutenant Schreier, Commander Young, and I thank the court for their attention today. All right, the case has now uh, been argued. There's no further questions from the bench. Uh, it is now hereby submitted to the court, and the court uh, will issue an opinion in due course. Uh, court stands adjourned. We ask counsel to remain in the well, pursuant to our custom for the, the, uh, the judges to enter the, the well to greet them after argument. America and the Courts is our Saturday night feature, reviewing the week's Supreme Court actions and other aspects of our judicial system. The program can be seen Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for Pacific. Earlier this year, the C-SPAN school bus visited the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This museum was established in 1928 by the Lincoln National Life.